good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are connecting from, you are connected to the FAO Regional Food Safety Conference for Asia and the Pacific. This is the day four of the uh, four sessions of the conference. Welcome to the conference. If you mouse over the screen, you will see the menu chat and that's where all the participants are writing the messages to everybody. If you would like to join this networking opportunity, I suggest that you type your message and make sure to select all panelists and attendees from the two fields so that everybody can see your message and write whatever you like, the, your name, your country, where you're connecting from, what sector you're from, what agencies you're from, and then you never know that there's somebody who may know you uh, might contact you. So this is how it works, the online networking. Also in the chat box, you see uh, the links of YouTube that now that this session is online, that the web streamed on our YouTube channel of FAO, and you have a link on day four. If you want to catch up on the previous sessions recordings, you can see the links in the chat box to have all the recording files. You can watch now or you can watch them later. Make sure to choose all panelists and attendees, both of them, so that everybody can see your message. I see somebody connecting from OIE, our sister agency in Bangkok. Welcome to the conference. Good morning, colleagues in Bangladesh, the FAO office. Welcome to the conference. You might like to select all panelists and attendees to show your message to all the people who are attending the meeting. Today, we have a very interesting topic to cover. Today, we are talking about the communication on food safety. We have lots of experts lined up and we will be discussing the misinformation on food safety in the region. It's going to be very interesting, very educating, so hopefully that you will enjoy the discussion. I have somebody connecting from Madagascar. Thank you so much for connecting. Welcome to the conference. Now that I would like to use this opportunity to um, provide you some uh, tips that now you're using the chat box to greet to everybody, but then I would like to introduce another function of Zoom. Uh, right next to the chat um, icon, you see the Q&A icon. Uh, if you mouse over the screen, you will see on the bottom. Uh, please do not write the question yet but then you can take a look at the Q&A box for now. You see uh, on the top that um, um, the, in the, the Q&A session that the, you can, uh, Q&A box that you can write the question there, not yet, but then uh, when the speakers start speaking about, you can write the questions in this Q&A box directly. And may I kindly ask you to write the name of the speakers. Uh, we will introduce you uh, the speaker's name as they speak and um, address them uh, when you ask questions so that uh, the speakers know exactly which questions to answer. And then Q&A box that uh, you can see that the questions that you might like to ask um, the same questions and maybe some other people might have ask the same question, then you can click on this uh, like button so that it, you can vote uh, to those questions and it will be promoted to the top. So um, please use that function to ask the question. Make sure you write the name of the speaker so that speaker would know. And then once answered online, then uh, it will be moved to the answered tab.
So during the session, we will be using this Q&A box to have the questions and then moderators will be picking up your questions so that those questions can be asked during the session. But then uh, we may not have enough time to answer all the questions you might be asking, but then don't worry that the, we will make sure to have your questions answered in the final report. We will be taking care of all the questions you're asking during the session. So during the session, use the Q&A box, and, but then right now use the chat box. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I can see in the chat box that um, somebody from Pakistan, thank you for joining. And then somebody from ITC, welcome to the conference. This Pakistan person is very young, 23 years old. Thank you so much for telling us that we love to have the young generation participants in our conference. This is somebody from Madagascar. Thank you for connecting. Greetings from Myanmar. Welcome to the conference. You can see on the screen, some people ask about the certificate. We can provide a generic certificate to everybody who registered and attended the, um, the conference. We won't be able to write your name on the certificate because we have more than 1,500 people registered to the conference. So it's not possible for us to write your name, but then you will be able to have an access to the generic certificate if you registered and attended. So Zoom has this function to collect all the email addresses of the attendees. So we will be able to send you the link to download the certificate. Also, as long as the presenters agree that we'll be able to share the presentation files with the participants after the conference. Right now that it seems that um, the microphone system is working perfectly. So you should be able to check your sound system by me talking continuously. And I'm checking the chat box that I see Malaysia. I see Pakistan. Very good. Welcome to the conference. And in the Q&A box that you see the link to the YouTube uh, recorded files and today's live stream session is already online on YouTube channel. Please feel free to share this link to the people so that people who may not have registered to the Zoom meeting should be able to watch it without registration. Greetings, Sri Lanka. Welcome from Sri Lanka and the Philippines. Okay, very good. So uh, in five minutes, we'll be starting our conference. But then before that, uh, we would like to show you one video from the government of Thailand. And then after the video, we will start officially the last session, but the very important session of the Regional Food Safety Conference. So enjoy the video first.
Thailand has set a goal to become one of the 10 food production centers of the future. Coupled with the food safety issue, we are therefore well aware that our responsibility is not only for the health and safety for Thai people, but also for all people around the world who consume Thai food. We aspire that not only food is our culture, but food safety will be our culture as well. The Thai government uh, has strengthened the improvement of food safety system in Thailand. In the year 2004, the government declared the year as a food safety year and approved the roadmap of food safety since then. The roadmap of food safety has been implemented along the food chain, cover five steps of the food chain, starting from the importing of the food and then control of the food production at the farm level, then control of the food production at the processing and industrial level, and the fourth step has a control of the food that go to the market and the last step is the control of the market price either the domestic market and the export market just some year after that in 2008 the government uh, start the agricultural standard act and the agricultural standard act cover the setting of the standard and the inspection and certification of the standard. And the main standard cover starting from the farm for the good agricultural practices and then go to the factory for the food manufacturing practice standards and then the food product standard. Since 2008, more than 300,000 farmers have been certified according to the standard established and the food product going to the market also have been certified. We also have a community consumer protection volunteers who are equipped with medical science knowledge to, perf to perform an initial screening test. Thailand had received well support from the FAO through the project on institutional strengthening on food safety and quality control in supply chain management of livestock products which aim to create collaboration and strengthen the work of the two main agencies responsible for meat product, namely the Department of Livestock Development and the Ministry of Public Health. To ensure the safety of meat food products throughout the supply chain, or in another word, from farm to table, we have jointly studied to the problems and obstacles and also identify the solutions to enable us to work smoothly and efficiently. The result of two agencies working together with the good support from the FAO is a handbook for control and monitoring meat products throughout a supply chain. These two can also be used for traceability of the products. Moreover, Thailand works with the FAO in another issue, including food safety information exchange and coordination through the International Food Safety Authority Network or InfoSan. We participate in the codex standard setting, provide comment and data, and also propose standards and data information for setting up the codex standard.
good morning good afternoon and good evening to everyone wherever you are first let me welcome you all to this fourth and final day of the regional food safety conference for asia and the pacific and before anything else we hope that wherever you are you're safe and well and keeping everyone in your family safe by following all the health measures for covid-19 so like every other day that we've had where in the last three in the last couple of weeks when we had three days of the conference we've already almost started almost each session with more than 200 participants sometimes even 300 and we see that today again so thank you all for taking the time and joining us from various time zones we noticed that some of you are joining is at at very let's say inconvenient hours but that shows your interest and your commitment and we will make sure that your time here at this conference is very well spent at what we are going to do i'll just first cover what we have uh, heard over the last 3 days at the conference so we started day 1 with the theme being on national food control systems so there we first heard an overview of the key elements and building blocks of national food control and we heard about the different examples or cases that we have in this region both from one countries which are highly developed and very very well organized such as australia new zealand but then also from countries which are in transition and are building the food control systems such as bangladesh we also heard examples from some of the other countries such as myanmar who talked about some of the key issues in their country on day 2 we looked at um the role of science and how it underpins food safety and the point that was made by all the speakers is that you need to depend on science on scientific methods on data to actually make food safety based decisions this cannot be based on hearsay this cannot be based on the news it needs to be based on hard facts and here we heard about how science and technology is being employed first by a big private company which is mars which handles big food stocks and has consumers all over the world sells millions of products every day and therefore they have to ensure very tight control of their food safety to ensure that there is no loss both in terms of consumer health and also in terms of the reputation we then heard um the from professor delia grace on the risk based prioritization of food hazards and she brought in a very interesting perspective on what should be the key criteria to look at some of the major risk in terms of the damage they do to hum to human health in each in various regions of the world and then not focus so much uh our focus much less on the long tail of other contaminants that that are there we also heard specific examples from uh, dr timothy barkham on streptococcus a galacte which produces the gbs toxin in fish or in tilapia in particular and the studies in the region and also on clostridium spore germination inactivation we had from and this was from Prof, uh, professor patima who works at kasit start in the university here in bangkok we also then heard about some of the from masami my colleague here on the risk analysis framework and how it is actually used to underpin uh, to, to to use the science that underpins food safety and make make risk management decisions and make life easier in a way for risk managers so that was on day 2 on day 3 we spoke about extra we spoke about food safety standards and their how they are deployed in trade and industry and how they can be brought closer to small scale farmers or uh, sm- who are numerous in this region in, in fact the asia pacific region has the highest number of small holder farmers and family farmers so how do we get food safety practices close to them how do we get standards and codes of practices to be adopted on a wider scale and why why is this important both in terms of the economy of countries in terms of their export and import balance in terms of trade in terms of their reputation and in terms of it things like tourism 
Let's not forget that as this region starts to recover from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, tourism and therefore food within tourism is going to play a very important role and therefore food safety becomes even more important. So this point was brought to the fore by Sanjay Dave, who also talked extensively about the experiences of India in setting up their national food control and in delegating their standards and the implementation of codes of practices in various sectors of the food industry to the leaders of the food industry and to the practitioners. So that was vital as, the, as a country as big as India starts to improve its food safety all across the chain. We all then heard from Hana Zhang uh, from Alibaba, again, a big major tech company from another huge country, China, which again has another, a big population. And there, where, how they are deploying technology and digitalization across supply chains and food chains to improve food safety, as well as other sustainability issues, such as reducing food loss and waste. So these, are, these were two examples from two big and heavily populated countries in the region, which actually show the way for many of the other countries which have similar problems, but possibly on a lower scale. We then had a very interesting discussion on, uh, uh, from two of the codex con contact points from the Pacific, one from Tonga and one from Samoa. So we had Dr. Manu from uh, Tonga and Dr. Chu Ling from Samoa who talked about some of the issues that they face, particularly in imported food control, because this is the Pacific and they are heavily dependent on food imports. And then looking at, and also they are very diverse island with very small populations. So in many ways, some of the food control issues that require a critical mass. So for instance, a critical mass of samples for analysis or a critical mass of practitioners with whom they can work. Are, which are common in the big countries are not so obvious here. So what are the kinds of, of practices that can be put in place and how were some of the issues that they actually discussed. This discussion was chaired by or moderated by uh, Ifan, who is from Food Industry Asia, and which, is a represent, which represents a host of private sector organizations in this region. And she gave us a perspective on how they as an association promote food safety, promote standards, promote harmonization, especially through the regional groupings, and then try to ensure that cross-border trade is facilitated across the region. So that actually now puts in the third point of the package where we were actually talking about the, the private sector, why they are important, because they implement food safety the government sets the tone by uh, framing the regulatory and legal framework, but the implementation is in the hands of the private sector, and especially many of the smallholders or the millions of them that are there in this region. So we actually got to that point where we now have covered the chain, but here comes now the last and critical part, the role of the consumers. So what is it that they need to be aware of and what is it that they also need to be aware of that could not be the right information? So on that issue, we are now, today's um, session is actually first half of this, is looking at getting serious about managing food safety, misinformation, and communication. It's important here that we actually look at what are the sources of here and the internet and how we manage and understand this information. So to do that, we actually have two excellent speakers who were there to let us know more both about fact checking and about communicating uncertainty in food safety. So the first one is in fact a person who is on the ground and fighting this all the time. So what we will do before we go further is to look at and um, go ahead with that session is it is right now that my great pleasure that we will now have um, do uh, have a thanks for the teams that have organized this uh, conference. And we will then have um, a kind speech from the Secretary General of the National Bureau of Agriculture Commodity, 
and Food Standards, Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives, Thailand. So before we go further, I would just like to acknowledge the fantastic team at the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand, each of whom have put in a lot of effort over the last four, not just over the last four days, but over the last few months to organize this conference along with the FAO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. And let's also remember that the Ministry of Public Health is at the forefront of fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. So I thank them again for taking the time to work with us to put this together. So I'd like to thank first Dr. Paibun Imkum for his dedication, his leadership, and his strong vision for food safety in the region. Ms. Nongluk Siti Charunchai for her guidance and advice on various aspects of the conference. Ms. Kanya Rat Karnasuta, Ms. Viraya Kodchoklom, Ms. Tonya Fon Kong Chai were always part of the team who were in our meetings and getting all parts of this meeting together. Uh, we have our IT genius, Mr. Sadapon Chawal Chitipon, who was always willing to help and fix all the glitches that we had and, and the credit for having this very smooth conference all through on this virtual platform goes to his, him and his team. We have also, we also thank Ms. Parichat Yusuk and Ms. Mr. Net Nari Samjun for this. So this was a joint effort and this would not have been possible without the great cooperation and the fantastic collaboration we had Ministry of Public Health. On, the, on day one, we actually had opening remarks uh, by the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Public Health, Thailand. And in Thailand, both the Ministry of Public Health and the Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives have a strong collaborative relationship on food control, which is a sign of a great food control system. And today I have the pleasure of inviting Mr. Pisan Pongsapich, the Secretary General, National Bureau of Agriculture, Commodity and Food Standards, Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives, Thailand, who will provide the conference final day remarks. His speech is through a recorded video. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Thai Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives, thank you for these four days of virtual regional food safety conference for Asia and the Pacific. I would like to thank FAO for the support and assistance it provides in the area of food safety to the countries in the region. Food safety is a necessary requirement of food security. Safe food is critical not only to better health and food security, but also for livelihood, economic development, trade, and the international reputation of every country. Foodborne disease impedes socio-economic development by straining health care system and harmful national economic tourism and trade. The access to sufficient safe and nutritious food is key, yet data on the impact of unsafe foods are alarming. This year, this was emphasized by the COVID-19 pandemic, which had impact the business of food and agriculture. There was an increasing number of fake news and misinformation circulating about the topic of COVID-19 and food safety, and such misinformation has had an impact in the trust of consumer and food trade. This pandemic has also highlighted that the big volumes of the food supply chain need to be managed safely, and to do this, collaboration among sector and countries is a key. The Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives of Thailand is also committed to use science for evidence-based 
prioritization and to use scientific data that has feedback into regulation. Food safety is key to achieve 2030 agenda and it is linked to many sustainable development goals. Of course, food security cannot exist without food safety. Furthermore, the adoption of food safety standards could help local traders to access new markets and increase their trade, as well as creating business opportunity for creating employment. For this reason, the Ministry of Agriculture of Thailand regularly participate to codex alimentary activities aimed at harmonizing food safety across the globe. This conference has touched various different aspects of food safety and is high, highlighted how all the different sectors involved in the work of food safety are strongly related to each other. The Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives will continue to collaborate with FAO to strengthen food safety in the country and in the regions. Food safety is a shared responsibility, and this is the vision we can only achieve together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pisan Pongsapich, uh, and for his very kind remarks. And it actually, again, demonstrates the strong collaboration that exists across the food control agencies here in Thailand, and also our strong collaboration with them uh, through, through the various projects. So we are now ready to start the proceedings of today um, on the four, day four. And our focus first is on misinformation. And our first speaker today is Ms. Rachel Blundy, who is the senior Asia Pacific editor of AFP Fact Check. Now, AFP is Agency France Press, the oldest news agency in the world, founded way back in 1835. And Rachel Works is based in Hong Kong, and she has expertise in verifying user-generated content on social media. So she is going to tell us on how to debunk food safety misinformation or even misinformation in general. How do we fact check? And how do we ensure that we get the right information and we pass it on to others? So over to you, Rachel, and welcome to the conference. So while Rachel is coming online, uh, we can just give you, okay, there she is. Over to you, Rachel. Hi, sorry for the delay. Hi, my name is Rachel Blundy. Um, I'm a fact check editor from um, AFP and I'm based in Hong Kong. I uh, wanted to talk to you today about misinformation that we are seeing around food safety um, and health. Um, it's a very common issue around the world and we see it fairly prevalently in, in Asia. Um, so I'll just share my screen with you. Can you see my screen? Hopefully you can. <laughs> yes, um, we can clearly. Great, great. Um, 
Yeah, so um, we work in uh, 13 countries and territories in Asia Pacific um, to debunk um, misinformation that is circulating online. Uh, that might be on social media, it might be on blogs or um, any kind of forums. And today I just wanted to give you an overview of what we kind of look at in terms of food safety. So if you've never heard of us, um, AFP Fact Check is part of AFP news agency, uh, Agence France Press. Um, we are um, the largest fact checking news organization in the world currently, uh, covering the most countries. Um, we are a third party fact checker for Facebook, uh, which I'll talk about more in detail later. Um, we also uh, recently established um, a, a contract to fact check TikTok. Um, and, you know, we're, we're working with other fact checkers around the world to try and fight this, this tide of misinformation that you see online, um, which can be particularly harmful uh, in regards to people's health. So just to give you a sense, um, this is our network currently as of November 2020. Um, we're covering 81 countries uh, in 18 languages um, with 94 staff. Um, and this is expanding all the time. Uh, we are constantly adding new countries and languages to our portfolio. Um, and basically that means that we're, we're getting um, a very good coverage and we're also able to reach users who um, may otherwise not be um, kind of uh, shown the true facts of, of a situation or, or the reality of a particular post. Um, we, we, we think that we are able to communicate very, very well with those users who might otherwise be missed. Um, so yeah, you see a list of our, the languages we're publishing in currently at the bottom there. So in terms of misinformation broadly, um, we often feel as though there's too much to fact check. Uh, there's, there's kind of a deluge of, of misinformation circulating online and it can be a bit overwhelming. Um, so we have a kind of criteria that we've established for ourselves um, in order to prioritise the most important and most harmful misinformation. Uh, and so that we um, hopefully debunk the, the most kind of worrying falsehoods that could mislead individuals. So here are the uh, list of criteria we generally follow. Um, we look at which posts have had the most impact online, so uh, how many shares or how many views um, a particular post has had. We think about which posts um, have some kind of news value um, and relate to some kind of current news event. Um, that, that is often a, a, our way of kind of framing something um, in order to make it relevant and interesting. And for even for people who may not have encountered the misinformation, we want to reach those people too. Uh, we talk to each other about which posts might have the most potential for damage. Uh, so kind of causing um, religious tensions or causing people to ignore the um, pandemic, obviously, uh, in terms of social distancing. Um, and then we also look at whether, um, you know, there could be political discord um, caused by a particular post that is unnecessary, um, and whether maybe accounts um, are impersonating genuine people. Um, all of these kinds of considerations are, are important. And then finally, um, in order to kind of get the go ahead for a fact check, our reporters have to demonstrate to us how they can debunk a falsehood comprehensively. Um, if they don't have enough kind of factual visual evidence to show why something is false, then we would regard that as more of a kind of conspiracy theory based post uh, that we can't show in a very visual or very um, kind of 
thematic factual way uh, that it's false and therefore it's not sort of worth amplifying the falsehood if, if we can't debunk it so we, we often have to leave some of those posts. So in terms of um, food safety, uh, this is kind of a topic that often occurs in Asia Pacific um, and it's of often obviously um, inextricably linked to health misinformation. Uh, sometimes people are sharing things that they're trying to check out, they're not sure about something. Sometimes people are sharing things that are deliberately false and misleading and they're trying to create kind of uncertainty. Um, so we often see, you know, food safety misinformation will cause panic and anxiety. Um, people are obviously very concerned for, for their health um, and they'll be worried that some things might have um, caused some sort of health problem, uh, some sort of uh, condition, or they might be sharing potential cures um, involving food that are not verified by legitimate doctors. This um, overall, I would say, uh, in our experience, can lead to an eroding of the trust in health authorities locally. Um, and it means that those people who share that kind of health or misinformation may not um, generally want to follow advice from health authorities. And this is kind of worrying for, particularly obviously during the pandemic, um, it's, it's worrying for how our societies operate. Um, and I would say this this very much happens regardless of the um, the, the place in which we're fact checking. Uh, it can happen in developed nations. It can happen in developing nations. It's it's everywhere. Uh, this sort of um, theme of misinformation can also have real world impacts. Um, we can see things like boycotting of, of certain produce based on a, a, a false belief about that produce that might in turn lead to a decline in sales for farmers, businesses, um, which is all very concerning. And, and you know, it's, it's such a shame when that happens when it's based on a complete lie. Uh, on the right here, you can see a fact check that we wrote about um, some viral misinformation that was being shared across Asia uh, with this claim that um, apples are covered in, a, you know, unsafe kind of wax that could be harmful to your health. And the video was suggesting that you should boil water, pour it over the apple and, and remove the wax. Um, but obviously, any uh, of this kind of thing that is any of this kind of wax that's found on apples uh, across the board generally it, it's just food grade wax that is certified safe to eat um, so although these videos look quite alarming they they're actually there's no cause for concern and uh, the people sharing these videos um, you know they, they were kind of creating panic where it wasn't needed so we we were quick to debunk that um, across across asia and here you have another example of um, a fact check we wrote about this kind of misleading claim i think it was being shared on on instagram uh, that drinking bubble tea could directly cause gallstones. Um, and there was a very misleading video being shared alongside this. Uh, we spoke to doctors, um, we spoke to the health authorities and clarified this is a complete hoax. And, uh, you know, the video looked very scary and disturbing, um, showing a potentially, you know, um, showing gallstones that were allegedly from bubble tea, uh, but it was not true. Um, so when we go about this kind of um, fact checking, we're always looking for quotes from trusted sources, uh, such as doctors, health authorities, um, to clarify why something is, is false. 
Uh, we may also, in the course of our health misinformation uh, debunking, we might reference credible scientific journals, um, you know, ones that have been peer reviewed in order to give some additional context and, uh, you know, reliable information in our fact check. Then we also have this process um, called verifying user generated content. So that's any videos or photos that are being shared online, uh, generally on social media uh, by individuals. Um, we try to establish where those photos and videos have come from, what they actually show, uh, where they were filmed. Um, and we use techniques such as reverse image searching, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, so we can see where the images appeared online and, and then we can um, establish maybe where, it, where it's been taken from. We can find photographers and videographers who captured those particular pieces of UGC and we can speak to them about what, what they show. Um, we find that is um, a very rigorous way of um, kind of establishing what is um, true and false online. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, AFP is part of the Facebook um, third party fact checking program. Uh, we're part of um, the this network with more than 60 other fact checkers. Um, you can read more about this on the Facebook website, uh, the Journalism Project website. Um, we're also a signatory uh, to the International Fact Checking Network, um, which is a kind of a collaboration between fact checkers and we, and we adhere to the IFCN's um, policies on, on fact checking uh, to be transparent and objective and, um, you know, willing to fact check um, both sides of, of a debate. Um, so you can read more about the IFCN and what they're doing on their on their website. Um, we are actually covering more countries than any other organization currently in the program. Um, we um, post our fact checks on multiple platforms to, to help stop the spread of misinformation. Um, and we have, you know, billions of people who are um, available to, to view our fact checks. Um, we, we kind of hope that by rating articles as false, um, less users will be inclined to, to share the, the misinformation. So on Facebook, um, we will rate something in the Facebook system as false or misleading. Generally, those are the two ratings we, we focus on. Um, and that will reduce the visibility of a post by 80%. Um, that means that um, it's less likely to, to show up on someone's newsfeed. Um, it also um, means that anyone who uh, tries to share the post will see this kind of gray overlay that you see on the left um, and they can choose to read the fact check. They can also choose to watch the video or see the photo. We're not censoring, we're not removing content. Um, it's, a, it's still a free choice, but we find that uh, in general, this, this kind of warning reduces the visibility of the post and reduces the likelihood that it will be shared. Um, page administrators on Facebook will also be notified if their page has been fact checked and uh, Facebook, I think, um, if they see repeat offenders, they can then choose to remove a page, um, but that's that's their decision again. That's not our decision. Um, it's it's up to them which pages they think are are particularly um, egregious in what they're sharing, um, and they will have their visibility downgraded in the Facebook system, um, even if they remain online. Uh, they are also banned eventually, repeat offenders are banned from monetizing content. Um, so that's obviously uh, a big kind of um, negative for them, which in, in theory, it, it should um, reduce the chances of them sharing misinformation in the future. 
So thank you so much for listening. Um, that was an overview of what we're doing in Asia Pacific. Um, and I'm very happy to take questions at this point. Um, yeah, let me know what you want to ask. Thank you very much, Rachel, for the wonderful presentation. Very clear and then very nicely um, put together. Um, here that I would like to remind all the participants to use the Q&A box that I have expl uh, explained earlier. If you mouse over the screen, you will see the menu on the bottom that it says Q&A. You can type your question there and uh, you can address to Rachel if uh, your question is about the, the current presentation so that we will know that this pre uh, the question is asked towards Rachel. And meanwhile, that we will start a discussion session. So please stay, Rachel, online, and then I will give the floor to uh, Shridhar. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Masami, and thank you, Rachel, for uh, putting that in front of everyone, and especially that it's very reassuring to know that you actually have a, a process through which facts can be checked, and your and the partnership with Facebook is extremely important given its reach all around the world and its role in supplying information to billions of people all around. So I just had a couple of uh, first questions for you. One of the things that I would request all uh, the participants to, uh, to ensure when they ask Rachel any questions is we don't need to refer to specific cases here. We are more interested in the process that is important for verifying information and then use that process to see where, how we can find the information that we need, the right information. So therefore, we are not trying to ask Rachel anything specific about what about this case or that, but rather ask her more questions on the process itself and how it, they are actually helping a number of entities in this. So one of the key questions here, Rachel, is... Um, What's the volume in your estimate of misinformation? How many do you have to do every day? And this is not about the job, but how many do you see every day? And then you have to allocate it probably to various uh, people to look into it. So give us an estimate of what you think it is like. Well, it's um, a huge amount of misinformation. We cover 13 countries and territories, and I would say we produce um, at least one fact check per day from each of those countries and territories. Um, but that doesn't mean that that is all the misinformation that's out there that day. It, it might be that we choose one uh, particular fact check to focus on out of a possible three. Um, so that gives you a sense of how many possible stories there are out there every day. Um, some some claims are being shared on in terms of you know thousands of shares but some might be tens of thousands uh, others might be millions um so the scale is is varies a lot as well and um again looking at um do you, one of the things of course you mentioned when you talked about the bubble uh, T case and uh, well and thank you for saying that I think we have a lot of people here who drink bubble tea so they'll be very reassured <laughs> to hear what you say so um, in that case I mean one of the things that you did was to actually talk directly to the experts and in fact you actually in that article you actually mentioned the Ministry of Health which played a permanent role in um, ensuring that the, this misinformation did not last too long so do you, do you have, um, you know, do you follow that kind of approach in most other countries and are the experts there and the ministries there equally able to then respond to your request and put out these statements um, assuring consumers or the other way around? Over. Yeah, for sure. I'd say um, generally speaking, we, we would always go to the, the local Ministry of Health in whichever country we are. Uh, working in and they are often very responsive they're keen to debunk the misinformation they're keen to get the message out there um, but we also we like to have more than one source um, to debunk a claim people are sharing it 
being confused by it. Um, one, one denial uh, is often not enough to, to reassure people. So we ask doctors, we ask um, other health practitioners uh, for, their, for their opinion and try to create a kind of a picture based on variety of, of uh, health opinions. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult because health can be uh, sometimes a, a more subjective field, uh, obviously with alternative medicine and things like that. But, but when, we, when we see a claim like the Goldstone's claim, um, you know, there's, there's really no basis to, to believe that bubble tea, uh, as long as you don't drink it excessively, uh, could, could directly cause gallstones. Um, and so it's, it's not really something that is open to, be, to debate and, and we feel it's, it's okay to go ahead with a straight false on that one. So uh, one thing if uh, we could ask you, this could be from you know, anybody here. So when I get a message on WhatsApp or uh, well, any of the, uh, the apps that I use, what would you recommend? And, and if you see, if I'm looking at an item which I think I'm not very sure of, I have a few doubts, but, and therefore I'm, before I click the forward button, I want to have a rethink. What would you what would you suggest that we should do? I would say that um, with WhatsApp forwards, particularly now, um, there are many fact checks out there on these kinds of copy paste messages. So it's worth just going on to, to Google and, and searching the message text directly uh, word for word. And it's possible that a fact checker may have identified this particular hoax before and, and may have written some sort of debunk on it. Um, I'm finding that is increasingly the case, even for old forwards that um, have been around for several years. Um, the other thing to do would be if you can't find a fact check, then, you know, look at the general theme of, of the post and see if you can find any uh, credible local authority health ministry um, that discusses the particular claim in, in the message. I would always say, don't forward it um, unless you're absolutely 100% sure somehow that it's true. But with most of these WhatsApp forwards, we can never be 100% sure because they don't have a correct sourcing or um, you know a clear indication of who it's come from. So you know, I would generally say don't forward it at all. Thank you very much, Rachel. That I will pick some questions from the audience that I will ask two questions in combination. The first one is uh, probably a bit difficult, but then a bit quick that you have explained the process and uh, in average, or maybe the fastest uh, timing that to how fast can you react to one case? That's first question. And second question is, uh, Participant is asking, can you elaborate a little bit more about the need of uh, liaising with the uh, government or experts to do this process? Can you explain a little bit further? Thank you very much. Sure. So when it's a more straightforward claim, um, I would say we can debunk it and produce a report within a few hours. Um, we have quite a rigorous editing system, so we don't like to put anything online unless it's been seen by at least two editors. Um, but within a few hours, we can get something published. Um, and then, as I said, we tend to translate a lot of our reports into the local language uh, where the claim appeared. Um, so that can take a little bit longer, maybe another hour or two to, to get the translation out. But certainly within the working day, uh, we can have covered English and the local language. Um, in response to the, the other question, I would say that, you know, it, our reporters are very well connected in their, in their local bureaus in Asia, and they will have contacts uh, often by WhatsApp actually uh, with many of the local health authorities or ministers. Um, and it will be sometimes a very quick message to the local authority about something we're trying to debunk and we will get a reply within within half an hour 
um, with a statement because that's often in you know in certain places that's often how they prefer to to send over those responses. Obviously, if we're contacting a doctor who is uh, you know not someone we've contacted before, it could take a bit longer. Um, they might want to know more about us. They might want to have more detail on the specific claim uh, because this is their you know professional reputation on the line too so they don't want to say something that could be challenged later thank you very much a few more questions i am picking from the audience that the one question is that um, uh, do you deal with the uh, misinformation about food fraud for the fact check and then another question is that um, do you see the role of international organization in this process or with you? Um, in terms of food fraud, I suppose one thing we often see is um, a fake claim about something being halal or not halal. Um, and that's quite common. So we see photoshopped images um, where either a halal sticker has been removed or added. Um, and this can sometimes be a joke, but it will often be misinterpreted and taken seriously by many, many people. Um, so yes, that's the most common I can, kind of example I can think of in terms of food fraud. And sorry, your second question was about um, other international partners international organizations such as UN or us that they fail, do you see any roles in the process of um, this debunking the misinformation? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, I, I recently participated in a United Nations event um, in Asia. And I think, um, you know, you guys have pu published books about this kind of misinformation. I think this is definitely a um, an international effort and all partners need to be supporting each other to try and tackle this kind of wave of confusion um, in the world uh, to try to restore some sort of trust in authorities. Um, it's, it's very difficult, obviously many people are seeking what we might call alternative truths, um, but yes, I, I definitely think that we all have to kind of work together on this. Thank you very much. And then another question that I see is that um, for um, many people who spread the, uh, the misinformation, sometimes they are really believing in this information and then doing it for uh, with the goodwill to protect some loved one. And then People say that the education is important and then giving the uh, proactive information is important. You are doing a fact check of the information, misinformation shared, but then what can we do in your opinion that to do the proactive education of the general public in terms of food safety? What is your opinion about this? Over to you. Yeah, it's a really good point. I think many people share misinformation unwittingly um, and some people are sharing it because they're just trying to find out what is true, what is false. Uh, I don't think we should be too harsh on those people. I think we should try and encourage them um, through maybe local uh, media literacy campaigns, um, in schools, in universities, um, I think we should start this at a very young age where we try to give people a better understanding of what is real and what is not real online. Um, and I think ironically, um, you know, I'm sorry to say it's often, you know, uh, people of a slightly older generation who, who will forward things and share things that they haven't checked because maybe they didn't grow up with social media so it's harder for them to decipher or they're, they're not so clear on on why people will be sharing falsehoods um so i tend to see young people are less um less like misled by by a lot of these hoaxes because they they kind of instinctively know that facebook instagram twitter has lots of false information 
Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a collaborative effort that has to start in a very positive way from a young age, ideally, and and local media literacy campaigns um, uh, around particular events like elections or you know uh, key news events uh, can also help. Thank you, Rachel. So uh, first, I will actually, we know every day is a busy news day. So uh, we thank you first for actually taking the time to be here. And uh, I'm sure you must be getting lots of information to check on even as we speak. So uh, first, let me thank you for being here, for giving this excellent presentation. Uh, you uh, please stay online as we move on to the next presentation and then we will have further discussions as we go along. And uh, so, but on behalf of everybody, uh, thank you for introducing, well, talking about this topic, which is indeed very fascinating, but at the same time, it's, it's key that we ensure that everybody gets the right information. And thanks to AFP for doing this for many of us, because we do realize, rely on it a lot. No problem. Thank you for having me. Okay. So with... Um, Rachel having set the scene in many ways uh, by talking about misinformation and how it needs to be handled or how we need, what are the steps we need to take. We will actually now look at going further into this topic and in fact particularly looking at how do we deal with the, the content of this information, whichever way you see it. And so the next presentation is about communicating about uncertainty in food safety. And this presentation is by Dr. William Hallman, who is the professor and chair of the Department of Human Ecology and is a member of the graduate faculty of the Department of Nutritional Sciences of the Blowstein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rogers, the State University of New Jersey. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Hallman, thank you for joining us at this time. It's getting pretty late in New Jersey, and uh, well, and you're pretty close to Thanksgiving, so happy Thanksgiving, and uh, and thank you for joining us on this occasion. Just to let you all know that uh, Professor Hallman has a very distinguished background. He has served as director of the Rogers Food Policy Institute and as chair of the US FDA. Drug, the Food and Drug Administration Risk Communication Advisory Committee. And he has ex written extensively about numerous issues containing food, food technology, safety, illness, and food recalls. So today he will talk to us about communicating the uncertainty in food safety. And over to you, Dr. Hall. So thank you very, very much. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to have the opportunity uh, to talk to those who, who have joined the conference. I did have the pleasure of, uh, of joining the conference for the previous three days and, and found it uh, to be extremely useful and enlightening. And so I, I hope to follow in, in, that, in that spirit. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and you should be able to see my screen now. Um, as uh, as was said, uh, I'm I'm going to talk very briefly about communicating the uncertainty related to various food safety issues. Uh, before I begin my my formal talk, uh, I do want to point you to two resources, uh, which are downloadable for free. Um, one is from from the FAO and WHO called Risk Communication Applied to Food Safety Handbook. And uh, when you receive the slides, you should be able to click on these links and go uh, directly to the, to the books. The second one is called Communicating Science Effectively. Um, this was put out by the uh, US National Academy of Sciences. Um, and I had the, uh, the great privilege of contributing work to both of these books uh, on communicating about uncertainty and, and other issues. So I won't be able to say everything that's, that's important to say about communicating uncertainty, but these are two places to go to learn a bit more about it. Now, I know that you've seen this chart uh, in earlier sessions. Um, this is a fairly well-known breakdown of the different types of risk communication. And uh, what I really wanna say is that when we're talking about uncertainty, the importance of communicating about it 
uh, the timeliness with which we have to communicate uncertainty and and sometimes the methods which with which we can communicate uncertainty will differ um, and I'm going to spend a fair of uh, most of my time actually talking about uh, this kind of crisis communication where there is a high public health impact because of a foodborne illness outbreak um, sometimes a high level of public concern but not always uh, sometimes our job is to try to uh, communicate warnings and information to a public that's already been alerted. In other cases, there's, there is low level of public concern, and our job is to try to actively persuade people to, to pay attention and to take action. So mostly I'm going to talk about this, this, this upper part uh, of the chart. There are other issues related to uncertainty in addressing uh, issues of high levels of public concern, but low levels of pu public health impact. Uh, for example, I've spent the last 25 years or so looking at public perceptions of genetically modified foods, and that would fall into that category. And of course, the fourth one is a low level of public health impact and a low level of public concern, um, where there may be some people who are particularly interested in a topic and are, are, are seeking information about it. So let me begin with why communicate uncertainty. And you know, the, the essential reason is, or the most important reason, is that communicating uncertainty is essential to efforts to be transparent about how decisions are being made uh, about public health and, and particularly with respect to food and, and foodborne illness. Transparency is particularly important to public perceptions of institutional honesty. If you are not perceived to be transparent, then you're not perceived to be honest. Uh, perceived honesty is in itself key to building and maintaining trust in institutions. So there is a direct line to, uh, from transparency to trust that passes through perceived honesty. Why? Um, you know, why communicate uncertainty? Another reason is that we do have a responsibility to tell the whole story uh, about, uh, about a food safety issue. And often telling the whole story requires telling the parts that we're not so sure about. It requires saying what we don't know as well as what we actually do know. Some of our audiences also are aware that uncertainty exists in the data that's out there or, or the data that's possible to know. And they'll judge the credibility of your decisions uh, and your recommendations based on the perceived quality and the certainty of the evidence that's underlying your decisions. So they know that there is uncertainty and they're looking for you to explain what it is that you know and what you don't know and how you know it. It's also clear that failure to explicitly address uncertainty implies or gives the impression to the public that you have greater certainty than is often the case. And that's problematic because it can undermine trust if the information you have changes uh, or has to be revised in light of new findings. And there's a, a well-known example of that uh, with an E. coli outbreak in Germany uh, in 2011. And it was not just Germany, it was many countries in Europe that was initially thought to, uh, to be uh, tied to Spanish cucumbers. And as uh, you can see here, the, the, uh, the headline um, that can be translated as a killer germ comes from Spain. The problem was that there was there was uncertainty about what the foodborne vector actually was. But the result was because it was communicated with some certainty that Spanish cucumbers was the cause of the outbreak, uh, the, uh, the the public quickly discarded uh, Spanish cucumbers, food service, uh, discarded uh, Spanish cucumbers. So there ended up being a, a lot of, of, of waste of Spanish cucumbers. Um, the issue is it turned out not to be Spanish cucumbers that was the source of the outbreak. 
um, new information became available, better information became available, which actually pointed to sprouts that were that came from uh, an, an, an organic uh, seed source. Um, and the process of, of, of creating those sprouts actually um, led to the foodborne illness outbreak. So the, the problem was expressing too much certainty that it was Spanish cucumbers in the first place, which then made it difficult to actually say, well, there's new information that suggests that is in fact this other, this other cause. And, and because there was so much certainty expressed and the public obviously did not want to become ill, they discarded a lot of Spanish cucumbers. There was a lot of loss, a tremendous loss. Um, among the farmers, the growers of, of, of Spanish cucumbers, and it led to um, to real disagreements uh, between Spain and Germany and other countries, all really because there was an expression of of over certainty in pointing to this particular vector. So let's let's talk about uncertainty about what, in terms of foodborne illness outbreaks, um, the main issues of uncertainty are typically uh, related to who has already been affected, who may potentially have been exposed to the pathogen. Uh, there's often uncertainty about what the foods are that serve as the vector for the pathogen. There are lots of cases that, of, of that. And, and real, uh, real uncertainty about the sources and circumstances of the contamination. So even after figuring out what the pathogen is and figuring out what the vector is, we often don't know what the circumstances of contamination were. So how did this, how did this actually happen? It's important to talk a little bit about the sources of uncertainty about those kinds of things and other issues as well. There is, a, uh, uh, there is uncertainty about future outcomes. You know, we typically give risk estimates describing uncertainty in terms of probabilities. Unfortunately, these come from observation of an outcome's occurrence in specific populations, and those observations may not, in fact, apply to the specific situation that you're dealing with. And so you have some guidance, but you don't necessarily have precision in understanding what is likely to happen. And so one of the important questions for the risk analysis process, not just the communications process, is how certain are you of your estimates of probable outcomes? There are also issues related to the quality of risk information that you may have available, including real questions about the reliability, the credibility, or the adequacy of the risk information that you have. And you know, in academia, we often describe this in terms of ambiguity or vagueness of the evidence. So one of the other things that's, that you need to evaluate is how good is the evidence that you actually have on hand for, for making the decisions. As, as regulators, as public health officials, we're also often faced with, with real complexity in terms of the information that we have. And so uncertainties may also arise because of the need to consider multiple risks at the same time, to make sense of risks that are changing over time. For example, as an outbreak um, you know, occurs and, and continues to affect more people over time. And we often have a difficult time interpreting the consequences or, or the potential consequences of different actions that we might take in order to do something uh, to stem the foodborne illness outbreak. Um, you know, many of the actions that we might consider may have unintended consequences that need to be uh, need to be taken into consideration and dealt with. There are, of course, uh, the things that we know that we don't know, which may be sources of uncertainty, and we've just talked about several of those. But of course, there are always unknown unknowns, which are the things that we don't know that we don't know about. And it's the unknown unknowns that often are most problematic in trying to express uh, uncertainty. So uncertainty, when to communicate. Um, I've done work on, on risk communication 
around food issues now for almost for more than 30 years. And the reasons that I have heard uh, risk managers say that why they don't want to communicate uncertain information include things like fear of panic. That if we tell people that we, uh, we, you know, that we're uncertain or there are things that we don't know, that's going to suggest that we are not in authority. Uh, so we fear losing control. Uh, we fear that that we fear fear. We fear that the that the public uh, will have anxiety and panic uh, over this particular issue. Um, fear of economic loss. That if we if we you know, go out too early, for example, with uncertain information that there may be economic loss if we suggest a, you know, uh, recommend a particular action. Um, and sometimes uh, there's a lack of an alternative. So if we tell people, for example, that they should not eat uh, corn because, or, or maize because it's been affected by aflatoxin, uh, and there's really no other substitute for it. Um, there may be some ethical concerns about essentially warning people not to eat something that they have no choice but to eat. Still, given all of this, uh, rapid communication despite uncertainty is extraordinarily important in maintaining trust, in preventing or reducing the risks of significant harm to public health, um, and, and appropriately informing the public. So we really do need to express uncertainty uh, and, and talk about the issues that we know about as, as in a timely manner as we possibly can. And there, of course, there are a number of reasons for doing that. If you don't rapidly communicate and establish yourselves as the experts and authority on what's happening, even under conditions of uncertainty, Others will take your place. They will provide information. They will provide explanations, often that are incorrect, um, while they're waiting for you know for you to weigh in. So if you don't communicate rapidly and express what it is that you know and you don't know, others will share information that may be inaccurate or worse, and. Ultimately, you may be perceived or portrayed as hiding information if it comes out that you had information uh, that may have been useful to the public that you did not share because of your concerns that it was not absolutely rock solid. Rapid communication can also prevent or reduce the development of rumors and misinformation, the subject of our, of our, of our last talk. And you know, unfortunately, those rumors and that misinformation has been shown to disrupt trade and have many other significant impacts. So it's important for us to be out there first, to be out there with authority, and to express uncertainty about the things that we need more information about. So communicate even in times of uncertainty. It gives target audiences uh, the ability to take action to protect themselves. It increases your organization's ability to communicate effectively about future food safety risk issues by building and maintaining trust with key audiences and stakeholders. And it can mitigate the long-term financial cost of the risk issues to the community, both in terms of, uh, of illness, hospitalizations, uh, but often direct economic trade loss as well. So I can't tell you everything that you need to know about expressing uncertainty related to, to food safety issues. But what I can do is use my long experience to help prevent you from making the big mistakes. So what are the key mistakes? Key mistake number one is waiting too long to communicate. Unfortunately, the natural tendency is for us to wait for all the facts to be confirmed before communicating. Um, failing to acknowledge uncertainty, even when the quality of the evidence is weak, but you do have a credible signal that taking some action would actually help protect public health. Um, failing to get out there and speak and acknowledge the uncertainty is particularly problematic, both from the standpoint of protecting public health and protecting uh, trust in your, in your institutions. 
The third key mistake here is overstating the certainty or accuracy of the information that you do have available, especially in initial responses to events. Um, so be careful about not overstating um, the certainty or implying the certainty or accuracy of the information that you have, uh, which is greater than, than, than reality. The, uh, the fourth key mistake is oversimplifying the complexity of the issues involved. Um, and this is referred to in the academic literature as the CSI effect. And it's called that because there's a very popular television show that, that has been on uh, in, in many, many markets around the world for a couple of decades now. And CSI stands for Crime Scene Investigation. And there is good data out there that shows that American juries, for example, have been influenced by this television show in thinking that scientific investigations can actually happen much, much faster than, than in reality. So on CSI, which is an hour show, you can identify the murder murderer using scientific evidence in under an hour, including commercials. And so that's left the impression for many average people, for example, that you can do PCR in an hour when clearly you cannot. And so one of the things that we can be uh, very helpful in, in doing in helping both the media and the public understand the complexity is to talk about what it is that you need to do next in order to be more certain about the decisions and the recommendations that you're making uh, so, for example, if something is discovered, uh, well, this happens in the U.S. a lot, uh, a company will identify a potential uh, problem with one of their products and release, it, uh, release that information late on a Friday afternoon. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration here will immediately begin to investigate. They may have samples. They will talk to the media. And they will say, you know, we're, we're on the case here, we're, we're doing the investigation, we will have better information for you Monday morning. Without explaining that the reason that we won't have better information until Monday morning is not because we're taking Saturday and Sunday off. In fact, the staff is working around the clock to do this. It's just that the analyses take that amount of time. And so we need to be careful in explaining the complexity of the issues and the complexity of the analyses and the amount of time that those take in order to become more certain. The last key mistake I wanna talk about is providing inappropriate reassurance in the face of uncertainty. Uh, you know, our natural inclination is to try to reassure people that things are going to be all right. And sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes things are not going to be all right. They are not going to be made right. So uh, hopefully this is the price, uh, this is worth the price of admission. Um, over the last 30 years, I've, I've compiled a list of things that uh, both from, from, um, uh, from journalistic sources, but also from my own personal experience about the kinds of questions that people ask in a crisis the kinds of things that journalists ask me, the kinds of things that, uh, that the public asks experts. And essentially they are what happened, who's affected, how long will this hazard or this threat last, and how will I know when it's over? What are the consequences of, of this particular hazard? Can I do anything about it? Um, do I know what I need to do? Do I have what I need to do it? And can I do it by myself or do I need um, someone else to help me? Do I need to go to the hospital or is this something I can deal with myself? Then there's usually interest in what caused the problem and who caused the problem. So how did this happen? How did the contamination happen? Why did it happen? Could it have been prevented? Why wasn't it prevented? Okay, now that we know about the problem, who's gonna do something about it? Who's going to solve the problem? What can be done? How long is it gonna take? How effective will the solution be that you're rec recommending? And who's gonna pay for it? Then how will we know that the problem has been solved? How, how will I be able to trust that it's been solved? And what's being done to make sure that this problem does not happen again? So this is a kind of short 
um, checklist of the kinds of things that you may want to think about in a crisis uh, that you're going to be asked about. And, and often there are uncertainties about the answers to, the, to each of these particular questions. And so you need to be prepared to say what it is that you know and what you don't know about each of these particular questions. So the, the key to communing, communicating uncertainty, we wrote a bit about this in the FAO book. Um, I've written about this in, in academic literature. This is my script uh, based on research and based on experience that seems to work the best. So beginning with, this is what we know now about this particular issue. Let's call it a foodborne illness outbreak. So this is what we know now about the outbreak. This is how we know what we know. This is what we don't know. And here is why what we don't know matters. Here's how it impacts our, our recommendations, our decisions. Then this is what we're doing to become more certain, to address what we don't know. In the meantime, while we're continuing the investigation to become more certain, this is what we're recommending that the public do right now. Of course, our recommendations may change as we learn more and become more certain. So as better information becomes available, our recommendations may change. And of course, we'll continue to update you as new information becomes available. So we're establishing ourselves as the key authority on this particular issue, which means you're, you know, you're essentially sending uh, the message that you don't need to look for information elsewhere. We're going to be transparent and you can rely on us to be transparent and to give you the best information as it becomes available and to, you know, to change our recommendations when that makes sense. In doing this, you're actually priming the public that, uh, that there are some things that you don't know or you're not certain about yet, but that you are giving them information early so that they can, uh, they can take action to protect their health and public health, uh, and cueing them that things may in fact change as we go along. So thanks very much for the opportunity. This is where you can find me directly if you'd like to email me, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Holman, for an excellent presentation and for walking us through uh, the concept of uncertainty and how uh, we could be looking at a sort of a, a matrix to address this. So we'll just pick up a few questions from the chat. And as you would expect, a lot of what you said is deeply linked with the way that food safety information is communicated. and. Uh, so the first question from uh, the audience, and this is, I think, deals with the balance between timeliness and public expectation, is that some governments and authorities are reluctant to share their findings on outbreaks as they have limited data, but they have to reassure the public not to panic. So how do they solve this dilemma? Over to you, Dr. Al. So, you know, that is the fundamental question, honestly. Um, the natural inclination for public officials everywhere, honestly, is to try to make sure that they are absolutely certain before sharing any information. Um, because they fear um, that if they have to change recommendations or if what their initial statements uh, were prove not to be true, uh, that they will lose face or that they will lose trust. Um, and in fact, if you are able to express the information in the right way, if you're able to express uncertainty in the right way, it actually builds trust uh, with the public. It builds trust between governments because you're actually signaling to the public that you care en enough to share information that you think is important for them to know even if you aren't absolutely certain. You know, the, the basic test of this is if you, if you knew this information, would you share it with your family? Um, you know, even if you weren't absolutely sure, if it's important enough to share with your family, why wouldn't you share it with, with, with other people? 
Indeed, that's a, that's a great way to put it, um, Dr. Halman. Uh, the other next question that we have, and this is uh, more on how to link uncertainty and reproducibility and the probability of risk. So do you think uncertainty is synonymous to the variability in food safety issues? So this is one of the questions from our audience. Um, so if I understand the question correctly, um, there are often greater certainties with respect to certain kinds of foods or another way of saying it is that there are some foods about which we have greater uncertainties than others. Um, certain kinds of pathogens as well uh, are more difficult to, to do the trace back on. Um, so yeah, there is very, excuse me, there is variability um, in the kinds of uncertainty that we face based on different kinds of circumstances. I think that that was the, the, the answer to the question that was being sought. Bill, I would like to follow up on the point. Um, the question includes this uh, probability of the uh, likelihood of the, uh, the risk. And then I think that it happens in the food safety world that the risk levels change based on the uh, known uh, information. And then FAO has been uh, helping the government with the evidence-based, risk-based uh, management of the uh, communication and then also the risk assessment on food safety. But then during the course of the assessment, the, if the level changes, that how the communication uh, should adapt this change to, the, uh, to when you communicate with the general public. So this is the... Uh, for example, if the risk level was thought to be high at the beginning, but then in the end it goes down or the other way around, how should we adapt over to you? So that's a really good question. Um, you know, again, hopefully if you followed the kind of script that I've given, you've, you've prepared the public and other stakeholders that, um, that probabilities may change, that the information may in fact change over time. So it won't come as a surprise when you are giving better information or giving better probabilities. Um, what's key is when you have to change the information or when you're releasing new information, you have to say why it has changed. So why are the probabilities different now than, than they were uh, when, um, when you first began to communicate about this. Um, you know, talking about the quality of the information. Was it the case that the, you know, the initial estimates were based on very preliminary information or, you know, based on information from, from a neighboring country, for example, um, and now we have, have more information, better information, uh, explaining essentially why the probabilities have changed uh, is really, really an important process of this, um, not just explaining that the probabilities have changed. Um, and while we're on the subject of probabilities, it is in fact, prob explaining probabilities is one of the most difficult jobs of the risk communicator, in part because much of the public doesn't actually think in terms of probabilities, at least not mathematical probabilities. They think of things uh, more in qualitative ways, you know, things are likely or unlikely. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, my unlikely and Masami, your unlikely may in fact be different mathematically. So for me, unlikely may be 10%, for you, it may be 20%. And so simply communicating with the numbers uh, or communicating with this kind of verbal, verbal description may imply different things to different people. Um, and you know, generally speaking, there are going to be people, there are going to be important stakeholders with whom you have to communicate who are going to be interested in those particular numbers. But frankly, most people are going to be much more interested in what you recommend they should do. So they're going to be more interested in your decision than they are on the on the underlying numbers. 
Thank you very much. So um, if I understand correctly that the, you are giving us a very good uh, series of tips that the first of all, that uh, we have to be proactive in uh, to be prepared in terms of um, giving uh, upfront information that the, this is the information at this stage and the situation may or may not change in, in during the course of the action. And then if things change, we explain the reasons of the change. And then also that the, we maintain the uh, credibility as a honest um, source of the information so that people will keep the trust even the information change so that's what i am getting from your explanation so thank you very much and then also that you have mentioned that uh, this uh, idea of the probability is very difficult to uh, explain so perhaps that the education uh, regular uh, communication with the public may help in that sense. So, okay, thank you very much. Another question that I am seeing from the, um, uh, the chat box is a little bit related to what you said in terms of the interpretation of the information. So people are asking that we have so many different countries that the FAO has 190 some member states and then they have different language, different culture, different way of um, listening to the information, getting the information and interpreting the information. And then this person is asking that how the communication to the international setting should be managed in this different diverse world. So this is the big question, but then I would ask you for some tips for, as a communication expert, over to you. Okay, so so your audience does not ask me any easy questions. Um, I hope they feel like they're getting their money's worth. Um, so you know, one of the things that I've I've learned is with the very connected world that we have, you know, particularly through social media, uh, that pretty much everything is now a global issue. And you know, one of the things that we hear is when the American Food and Drug Administration or the USDA here uh, issues a or, or promotes a recall of a contaminated food product, uh, that one of the first things that happens is that people in other parts of the world will immediately contact uh, their food safety authorities to ask whether that's a product that exists or is imported into their, into their country. And so, you know, one of the things that I think makes sense for all of the countries that are participating is, is to share information and to kind of monitor what's going on uh, in other places because there are gonna be questions about those contamination incidences and, and those particular products. So you can pretty much anticipate that that's, that that's going to happen. Um, you know, I know that if it's in English and it's on Facebook or it's on other social media, um, people around the world are have the opportunity to uh, to share that information, to understand that information, even if it's incorrect information, uh, which is another reason why it's so important for food safety authorities to be, you know, to be first with the information, to be accurate, um, and to you know to to maintain um, this connection, this relationship with their with their potential audiences. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, it has been wonderful discussions and then also the very informative presentation that all the participants are writing comments in the chat box and then they have appreciated your presentation a lot. So thank you very much. Please stay online so that we can all join the discussion session after the next session. Before we move to the next session that um, um, I would like to inform everybody that we will go for uh, the short break, the 10 minutes break. And as usual, that we would like to present some videos from this today that we have a food safety video from the Solomon Islands and then also India during the break. And then after the video that we will resume the session and then we will have the next session with the very interesting interesting lineup of the speakers. So thank you very much, uh, the Sarah and then Bill for the excellent morning sessions and uh, see you in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. We want to ensure 
the, the food and the drink that we consume um, is not con uh, contaminated and our water is safe to drink. Therefore, in ensuring that um, there are food safety measures, our collaboration with our stakeholders, partners is uh, essential. The division that has the mandate to work on the food safety program in the country has achieved quite significantly a few uh, milestones, one of which is achieving our audit in 2017 and the rest to ensure that we are competent in the work that we do. The other achievements that we, we continue to is uh, the ongoing national capacity on our systems, including ongoing capacity development on, with our officers, our partners, our stakeholders, and ensuring that the systems in place are compliant with so that uh, we can uh, work in putting the appropriate measures in place on our food systems. comes by the form of um, ongoing uh, technical support and one of the technical support that uh, has been provided to the Ministry of Health is uh, to ensure that the National Public Health Laboratory has got the accreditation to test the water and uh, food products. So um, that is a huge uh, collaboration uh, between the Southern Islands government and uh, FAO. The other other area where we have partnered with uh, FAO is in the area of ongoing um, national capacity development and enhancement of our staff and officers, basically because we want to strengthen our food safety measures and systems in the, in the, in the country, but so much so with the Ministry of Health. So by providing these ongoing um, uh, strengthening of the systems. This has led to development and uh, drafting of various frameworks which includes an MOU on food regulations and this MOU was signed between uh, the Ministry of Health, Biosecurity and Customs and there was a, a draft of the Pure Food Act, uh, Pure Food, um, that was reviewed and drafted so that is in collaboration, collaboration between the Ministry of Health, FNU, and WHO. So, um, this is an, um, the, the partnership between uh, the Ministry of Health and FNU is much to do in strengthening the food uh, safety systems by providing um, the capabilities and capacities of the Ministry to ensure that they do their work well. Food safety is enormously important for India. We have a population of 1.35 billion people. And uh, the challenges that we face in terms of malnutrition, micronutrient deficiency, and in terms of the rampaging non-communicable diseases are so large that we have to find solutions that are different. The first step that we took was to bring in the Food Safety and Standards Act in 2006, um, followed by the setting up of the authority in 2008. We have notified standards for approximately 14,000 categories of food products, additives and colours. We've also set up a network of 188 primary laboratories and 12 referral laboratories. We have brought in regulations for newer areas such as uh, trans fat labelling, organic food, front of pack labelling and menu labelling. We have a very innovative system of capacity building and that is the uh, FOSTAC training. Uh, we have 140 training partners uh, who administer training and capacity building to stakeholders according to curriculum designed by us. A very important piece is the use of IT technology in order to be able to manage the scale of our operations. Uh, the FOSTAC system is our licensing and certification system. 
uh, that covers licensing, inspections and links also to uh, our testing and the import uh, systems. We've also brought in uh, tools for uh, building capacity and uh, voluntary compliance by industry, uh, food businesses, and that, uh, that takes the form of hygiene rating and third party audits, uh, which are voluntarily adopted by food business operators. Eat Right India was actually an approach to take a systems approach and to also make both the food businesses as well as the consumers a part of the system. A very interesting approach which I think is going to build the next generation of leaders which is the Eat Right challenges for districts, for cities and even to engage uh, our partnership of stakeholders through the net profan. So I think these uh, efforts are really creating the leadership which will take Eat Right India forward. We've been a member of the Codex Alimentarius Commission since it was set up in 1964. And uh, in 2015, we took over as the regional coordinator for Asia. Um, and over the last five years, our focus has been on fostering uh, cooperation and standard development uh, in Asia. We've hosted two very uh, successful CC Asia meets. And uh, we have also been part of uh, setting up two group projects under the Codex Trust Fund which have been well received and have built capacity of the membership. Um, I think um, and we also host the uh, Herbs and Spices Committee of the uh, Codex and in this capacity we are working steadily and strongly to generate the standards for these very vital condiments uh, most efficiently. So I think we have been uh, very much a part of the codex system. We worked uh, in recent years with the FAO to uh, also conduct a study on uh, food fraud and measures to address this and I think that uh, it's in this direction that we would seek to work uh, further in the years ahead with the FAO.
Welcome back. Um, and again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. And this, we are now entering the, the final session of the four day regional food conference, food safety conference for Asia and the Pacific. And this final session is again devoted to one very important topic. And this is at looking forward in terms of capacity building for food safety. As agencies, FAO, working with all the governments and working with our sister agencies such as WHO, we are involved in a number of food safety capacity building activities where we work with personnel to train them on various aspects of food safety, whether it's surveillance, monitoring, risk-based infection, laboratory analysis, and various other aspects. One of the, but as the world is changing, technology is changing, the way food is produced and it is processed is changing. The tastes and preferences of consumers are changing because of uh, issues such as urbanization. And then the way information is being transmitted around the globe, as we learn today, is changing. We need a new generation of food safety professionals. Those who are trained in current technologies in current ways that information is shared at the same time in the way that food needs to be uh, inspected based on risk, the way monitoring and surveillance needs to be conducted to ensure that there are preventive approaches all along the food chain. And into this and addressing this aspect, we have two excellent speakers who will talk to us in the next half an hour on looking at educational programs in food safety and how they are actually helping to develop the next generation of food safety professionals, not just for the public sector, that is for government, but the same in the private sector. And for all the young people, and at the beginning of uh, this morning, and in fact, every morning, uh, Masami had asked many of the young people to identify themselves. Well, let me just say to all the young people there that food safety is full of career opportunities. And those of you thinking in on those lines should probably hear very carefully of what on what the next two presenters have to say. So the first presenter now uh, is Ms. Sarah Boyd, who is from the Technical University of Dublin. She is the program chair and lecturer and has a prominent career in establishing several collaborative projects related to public health and food safety in different countries, such as Bangladesh, Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, and Ireland, her home country. She is a member of the Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and her research experience includes participation in studies on safety behavior in the construction industry, and an assessment of safety attitudes and climate in the catering sector. So in many ways, a real food safety or a safety expert who can talk about how these training programs can be developed. So her title of her speech is Establishing Educational Programs for the Next Food Safety Generation in Bangladesh. Over to you, Sarah. Good morning, and uh, everybody. And I want to say a very big um, warm hello from Ireland, and Kate Meadow Falcher. And I also want to say a very big thank you to the FAO for um, the invitation to deliver this presentation here this morning. So just before I start, I'll just share my screen.
Now, I just want to make sure that everybody can see my screen. Yes, yes, we can, Sarah. Great, thanks a million. That's great. Thank you, Sridhar, for that feedback. So in starting off this, um, and I'm so delighted, Sridhar, that you mentioned that over the last few days of the conference that we've had um, many young professionals joining you, and not only from um, Thailand, but also around the world as well. And I certainly want to extend a very, very warm welcome to those of you that are studying at the moment, either at undergraduate or postgraduate level. And I have to say, I'm really delighted to have you at this table this morning. I'm also delighted to see the other partners who are around the table, those working in private industry, within government agencies and also non-government agencies. So from my perspective, in terms of establishing educational programs for the next generation, we certainly have the right people around the table. And I think that's most important. So this morning, I want to ask you to come on a journey with me. And the journey that we're going to go on this morning is, I want to share with you a case study of how we developed a BSc in food safety management. Our two previous speakers spoke about communication and certainly edu education is all about communication. I'd like to take you on a journey now and share the process and the steps that we were involved in, in developing the new BSc in food safety management at the Bangladesh University, Agricultural University. This was certainly a collaborative project. And the main partners involved in this collaborative project were FAO, who very kindly funded the project. It also involved the Bangladesh Food Safety Authority. TU Dublin worked very closely with the Bangladesh Agricultural University to compile and develop this undergraduate program. I think this is certainly a very, very exciting time um, for education in Bangladesh. And I hope the case study that I share with you this morning gives you some food for thought in terms of sharing best practice, but also too for the development of future degree programs in food safety throughout Bangladesh, but also the development of CPD programs and capacity building for other educational programs throughout Asia and the Pacific region. So perhaps to start off a little bit about the background to this particular project. So as was mentioned, I think on the first day actually, um, with the passing of the 2013 BFSA Act, uh, the BFSA was established. And one of the most important key legislative requirements of the BFSA was to ensure adequate food standards. And with ensuring good standards, the BFSA need food safety officers. And I have to say, this is such an exciting time for young people in Bangladesh that there now is this educational opportunity available to them to become food safety officers. I think it's also important to recognize that this professional qualification, and that's what it is, it's a professional qualification, and it's recognized as a class one civil servant. So it should be a very, very attractive educational and professional and career program. So what the legislation has actually facilitated and what this project is all about involved the establishment and development of a new profession. So as I said, this was starting a new chapter in food safety management in Bangladesh. Now, we all have already have heard over the last few days the importance of food safety and food security in Bangladesh. And Sridhar, you actually remarked on this in your opening address, the close link between food security and food safety. You can't have one without the other. 
It's also important to recognize at this stage the level of development and Bangladesh has made huge strides in food safety management over the last number of years. And certainly I think the country will continue in this vein through additional collaborative projects. So maybe a little bit of a background in terms of how come TU Dublin was involved in this particular project and what exactly did the project involve? So the FAO approached TU Dublin and we were asked to conduct a feasibility study. And this feasibility study involved, was it possible to develop a BSc in food safety management? And what would that curriculum look like? We also were involved in the assessment of what was the capacity of BAU to actually deliver this programme? And then we were asked to assist BAU to develop the curriculum and to roll out the programme. As part of the feasibility study, um, a visit was made to Bangladesh and we met with the BFSA and we met with the university. And we certainly wanted to align this program and design this program and tailor make this program for Bangladesh. So it was very important that we had collaboration on this development program. It was also important for us, I suppose, involved and in leading the curriculum development that we had a really good insight into what food safety management is like and what food safety regulatory was like in Bangladesh at the time. One reason why I suppose TU Dublin were particularly involved in this project is because we are the only provider of the food inspector training programme in the Republic of Ireland. Now, if you, repair, if you compare Ireland to um, Bangladesh, you're working on a different scale completely. Population in Bangladesh, I think, is over 180 million. And if you compare that to Ireland, we have a population of nearly 5 million. So there isn't the same demand for food safety inspectors in Ireland as in Bangladesh. However, this is why there is only one university in the Republic of Ireland providing this education. And I'm actually the programme chair and um, delivering this programme and leading this programme. And I also completed this programme myself. So I actually went to TU Dublin as an undergraduate student. So I've gone through the process and I've sat on the other side of the fence as an undergraduate student. Our particular environmental health degree programme, which is our food safety inspector programme, is aligned completely to all of the EU food law and also to the Food Safety Authority Act. One reason why TU Dublin was chosen to conduct this um, project was because the BFSA Act of 2013 is specifically aligned and was designed based on the Irish Food Safety Act. So there's clear alignment there. Also to the expertise that we have in TU Dublin in terms of food safety management, food safety training and education, implementation of assessment and examination techniques, the approach to blended learning, and also the rollout of professional placement embedded within the undergraduate programme, we have a lot of expertise in that area. We also have worked on other projects and globally as well. We also have a very good reputation in terms of we attract high caliber students. So the students coming in in first year, they're very, very high caliber. And that results in us producing high caliber graduates. And our graduates are highly sought after both in the public and private sector not only nationally, but internationally as well. In 2013, TU Dublin were also involved and developed a model food inspector curriculum for the WHO. So I suppose you can understand now why TU Dublin were selected. We have a huge degree of expertise in this area. So perhaps we should work backwards at this stage. 
And we probably need to address what are the core competencies and what are the core skills that a food safety officer needs. So looking at the needs of Bangladesh, looking at the needs of these new food safety officers, what do we want them to look like and what do we want them to be capable of? And so the starting point for us was to, I suppose, refer to the, the WHO and what are the duties of the food inspector? And according to the WHO, the role of the food inspector are enforcement of food safety regulations, laws and standards in order to protect public health. So we also used a couple of key documents when we were developing the programme. So we used the BFSA Act of 2013. So we specifically aligned the programme to the legislation. We also looked at the um, Western Pacific model of food safety inspection curriculum. And I suppose one of the key documents that we used was our current food safety inspector program in Ireland. We had meetings with um, the BFSA, and here you see the Irish delegation meeting with representatives from the BFSA and also from BAU. It was important to establish communication. It was important to establish a dialogue and a discussion. And it was also important to establish trust amongst the key stakeholders within this project as well. So we sat around, we spoke, we discussed, we communicated, and we specifically discussed the requirements of the BFSA in terms of designing the program. And we also established what support BFSA could give in terms of rolling out and facilitating the program also. In dealing with the BFSA also, we also looked at what exactly did they want the inspectors to look like? What did they want them to be capable of? So not only did we want them to have the right skills and knowledge and competencies, but we also wanted the food safety officer to be enforcers to be regulators, to be inspectors, to be auditors. We wanted them to be risk assessors, risk managers, risk communicators. We also wanted them to be fully familiar if they had to take any legal proceedings. We wanted everything that they would be doing to be risk-based. We wanted them to be problem solvers. We wanted them to be able to interpret scientific information and use that scientific information in their risk-based decision-making process. So we certainly wanted to, we looked ahead and, and we thought, what exactly do we need to put into the curriculum to produce this high caliber graduate? At the outset, we also, as we said, we did a feasibility study and the key findings of the feasibility study included was BAU, is a well-established and a very prestigious university, and they were well capable of facilitating and rolling with this project. We identified extensive uh, international experience with excellent faculty input as well. We went and we visited the facilities, we went and visited their labs, we spoke to their deans, we spoke to um, the vice chancellor, we spoke with their staff, and we came away and confirmed that BAU actually possessed all the key scientific capabilities to run with this program also. We also identified that some support would be needed to develop non-scientific areas, specifically in the area of food law, food enforcement, enforcement techniques, also in the area of professional practice and internships, some areas of ethics, consumer behavior, management information systems, and information communication technology as well. We also reported that this food safety officer program is very much a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary program. And perhaps we needed a little more appreciation of the nature of this collaboration and this multidisciplinary approach to 
education of food safety officers. We also emphasized that professional practice placement is of great importance within the program. And this professional placement or called an internship is a six month period within third year and fourth year of the program where the students actually go out into public and private sector to get some experience even embedded within the undergraduate degree, degree program. And as we also concluded, a mix of industry and professional experience would be highly recommended to achieve all the core competencies. We followed on then and we met with the BAU Vice Chancellor and the Deans and we gave a briefing on the feasibility study. So again, communication was very important here that we maintained communication and updates at every step and at every um, step along the process as well. The next stage then was MBAU uh, appointed a course development team and that course development team came to Dublin and they came to Dublin in January of 2017. And I think the first thing that hit the development team was the cold. They couldn't get over how cold Dublin was in January. So they were all wearing heavy coats and hats and scarves. So what was the purpose of the visit from the development team to Dublin? Well, the first thing is we connected them with the Food Safety Authority of Ireland in Dublin, and they delivered a training day to the team. They also spent several days in TU Dublin, where we deliver training on teaching and learning at executive level. Also, we covered the area of quality assurance in higher education. And I know the next speaker, Linda, is going to speak specifically about quality assurance in higher education as well. We had an opportunity to discuss at length uh, the development of the curriculum. We had um, some lovely, I won't say heated discussions, but we had very healthy discussions about curriculum design and curriculum development as well. This visit to Dublin also presented an opportunity for our BAU team to visit the private sector in Ireland and see the standards of food safety in Ireland and also see how food safety businesses are inspected. So it was a great learning curve for the BAU team also. On return, the Irish delegation returned to BAU and we held a conference, we held a workshop. And as you can see here, we held a conference on the proposed degree. And this particular conference was specifically about engaging faculty members and management about the programme design and the programme development process. We all certainly recognised that this was a new chapter in food safety for Bangladesh. It was a very, very exciting project for everybody involved. It was most important for us that we had answered all of the questions and queries from faculty and from lecturers who would be involved in the programme as well. It was also an opportunity for us to really raise the flag and identify that this new food safety officer would be part of a new profession in Bangladesh. So then the hard work started. And as you can see, the numbers of people in the photo are getting smaller, they're being reduced. So here's the team from TU Dublin, um, myself and my colleague Fintan Moran, and our colleagues from BAU, Professor Chowdhury, Sukumar Saha, and also Kamrul M. Sahan. And we all worked together and we started backwards. We looked specifically at what did we want the graduate to be like? And we worked back from that. What we also did was we mapped the syllabus from Dublin to BAU. And we specifically wanted to use any courses, any programs, any aspects of syllabi that was already being used and had already been designed. So we didn't just produce a programme and hand it to BAU. We actually worked together and we wanted to certainly give advice and guidance in terms of what was required from a new food safety officer. But we also wanted to embed all of the good aspects that they had already in BAU. 
So the first thing we did was we looked at the entry requirements. So this was going to be a professional degree program. We specifically looked at the structure over the four years and what the building blocks would be from year to year. We looked at the detail between the theory and practice. We certainly had to sow and water the seeds with regard to having a multidisciplinary approach to this new program. So we had people from different faculty, from different departments, in different laboratories, in different buildings around the faculty, now coming together as a team to deliver aspects in a multidisciplinary way to produce this graduate. Obviously, we discussed and outlined learning outcomes for each course in each program. We then aligned the learning outcomes to the assessments and examinations. We designed in detail contact hours and the credits that would be applied to those. Every single module that we designed in collaboration together is based on risk management. Every aspect, whether it's the syllabi or the assessment, Everything is risk-based. Again, as I mentioned, we looked at the professional internship and maybe at another occasion, I might have uh, more time to talk about this professional internship at undergraduate degree level. Students also have to produce a research project um, between third year and fourth year because we also want these graduates to be involved in research. We certainly envisage that these food safety officers will have access to data, but will also be generating data through their inspections, through their audits, through their, through their food sampling program. So they're actually generating a data set, and now they should be in a position to analyze the data, share the data, and actually use the data and the analysis to possibly have an impact on policy and regulation also. We also, in the mapping exercise, we identified any gaps in the current programs being offered within BAU, and we were able to fill those gaps and um, design in capacity building in those gaps also. So I'm very happy to say here it is. Here is the program document. Uh, we successfully completed the program document in July 2017, and we handed the document over to BAU, to the BFSA, and also to BAU. So I have to say this was a, a momentous occasion to see that we had finally finished and successfully completed the contract. The next stage of the process was the launch of the programme. And I'm very happy to say that the programme was approved by Academic Council. The Faculty of Agriculture also established a new food safety management department to actually take the lead on this new program. So here we are in March 2019, BAU officially launched the first cohort of food safety officer students. This is a happy day. And I suppose if you further analyze the photo, you'll see lots of happy faces, but you also see hope. And I'm also delighted that you can see gender balance. If there's nearly a 50-50 mix uh, within this particular cohort. So they recruited approximately 30 students um, and this current cohort of students will be entering into their third year next March 2021. So, so far so good. The program is being rolled out and the students are making great progress. You can see as well the inaugural day of the establishment uh, and of the programme. It was a celebration. And I just, again, you can see officially that this is a new chapter starting for Bangladesh Food Safety Management. A little update in terms of what has happened in BAU over the last 18 months and the programme. You can see students are actually out in the field to doing a practical exercise. So they've learned the theory in first year of biology, chemistry and physics and water chemistry and whatnot. Here they are out monitoring um, water pollution. They're taking the water samples and they're then bringing them into the lab 
So they now have an appreciation of not only source, but also analysis uh, and scientific analysis of the samples taken as well. So not only are they getting the practical experience, but then they're getting the analysis. So now they're able to interpret the analysis as well. I alluded earlier to a multidisciplinary approach. And here we have some of the team involved in the delivery of the program. And here we have academic staff and lecturers and technicians as well, coming together from different departments and different faculty. So let's talk about the future. And certainly when I consider we probably have nearly 300 people around this international table at the moment. So I'm going to focus specifically on Bangladesh. So what are we going to suggest or what are the, the possibilities for the future? And certainly many of you around the table could be part of this future. So without a shadow of a doubt, Bangladesh, considering the population, it needs more food safety officers. And maybe we need to consider delivery of the training programme out of other um, educational units. And maybe we need to look to um, the centre and the south to, I suppose, meet that demand of food safety officers. We would also suggest the development of a food safety officer educational network so that these food safety officers can be part of a food safety officer community and also that there are regular updates for the profession as well. We already have spoken about the establishment of a food safety professional body. And when the delegation were in Ireland, we facilitated a meeting between the Irish um, professional body and they've given a lot of advice and guidance already for the future to set up this professional body. We're certainly encouraging sharing of professional and training best practice. And I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to share one case study with you. I think it's important also that we encourage exchange of specialist personnel, both uh, within regions, within universities, at national and international level also. I think it's also important that consideration be given to the design of induction training for new food safety officers as well, if they're coming maybe from a different discipline. We're certainly encouraging um, continuous professional development if there's any changes or new introductions to legislation in Bangladesh, and also if there's any new and emerging topics, that there could be standalone CPDs. And when you think of the current educational um, delivery, we're all online at the moment. We're all online from all corners of the world. And perhaps some of these CPDs and emerging topics could be delivered online. An important part of this um, specialist a degree programme is the collaboration between the public and private sector. We also envisage that these food safety officers will actually be employed not only by the BFSA and by the regulators, but also by the private sector as well. This graduate will have experience not only of the enforcement side, but also of the compliance side through their internship programme in third year. So I'll conclude in a couple of moments, but before I do, I would like to show you this important picture from the inaugural day. And I think the one striking thing about this photo is um, the joy and the happiness that is on these um, students' faces. So here they are with the Honourable Secretary of the Ministry for Food from Bangladesh. But here you can see there is hope in these undergraduate faces. I know today's programme is all about education and looking for the future. And I think we even need to look to not only the next 10 years, but possibly the next 20 and 30 and 40 years in terms of food safety, education and regulation. So certainly I would hope to see some of these little people starting food safety degrees in years to come. Can I say thank you very, very much for your time and attention this morning. 
I'm very happy um, to share this presentation afterwards, no problem. And also, if you have any questions or queries, please follow up in the chat box or with an email at a later stage. So, Shrudamar, over to you and thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for that in-depth look at the development of a course in food safety for a developing country and for walking us through the entire process. So we will uh, for now continue with the theme and we'll come back to the discussion uh, after the next presentation. And this is by uh, Dr. Linda Nicolides, who is the principal scientist and program leader at the Natural Resources Institute of the University of Greenwich in the United Kingdom. And she is a food microbiologist and a food safety and quality assurance specialist with over 50 years of experience in the area of food safety and quality assurance, working with both developing and developed countries and supporting the government with national food control systems. So she will continue on this theme and her title is, the title of her talk is Technical Education for the Next Generation Food Safety and Quality Assurance. Over to you, Linda. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning, <laughs> or good evening, good afternoon, whichever part of the world you're in. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk this morning. I'll just share my screen. Um, so, um, welcome to the UK, <laughs> the cold and chilly winter's morning at eight degrees, but um, we're going to be discussing as a final presentation in this meeting, technical education for the next generation, um, an area that I have been working in uh, for many years and am thoroughly committed to. This is our campus, if I go on to the next one. So when we are considering technical education and training, it's certainly been the underlying theme in this meeting. Although people were talking about national food control systems um, and the various tools that we use to ensure the production of a safe and wholesome food supply, I think most of the um, speakers have also mentioned training as an underlying requirement to ensure that systems work correctly. Certainly the next generation should develop a sound understanding of how food can be produced and manufactured to ensure it is safe and wholesome. And it's important too that each country develops an understanding of the foods produced therein and any products that are manufactured um, in, to make sure that they do comply with national, regional and international food safety standards. Um, certainly in national food control systems, we need to have training of um, young folk in how to develop policy and legislative uh, frameworks, enforcement both at regional levels, but also at border inspection posts. And of course, having folk who can work in laboratories and carry out analyses on various chemical, biological and physical hazards that they encounter in food. Um, so when we're strengthening countries' national food control systems, we need to have an understanding of the production and manufacturing systems which um, are being followed in that country. Um, we need to identify specific hazards that are associated with which food, and then these hazards need to be characterized so we understand the risk um, that these hazards may present to consumers and apply the appropriate control measures to prevent this hazard meeting uh, getting to the consumer. And so here we need to have um, younger folk coming into the industry 
understanding how to carry out surveillance and monitoring of foodborne hazards, collating and developing data sets that can then be used to, um, to carry out risk analysis um, and also to be used in setting standards for a particular country. And it has been said during this meeting before that um, we have international standards to, to, to support international trade, but each country may have different production systems, which may need a little bit of support so they can meet international standards. So they need then to set food safety objectives where they can improve particular systems such as fish or meat or agricultural products. So over a set period of time, they could improve, improve productivity and safety. Also, um, graduates and postgraduates should also be understanding the importance of the Codex Alimentarius Commission and the role they carry out in coordinating the Codex uh, Regional Committees. It's important that each country does send specific focal points to these meetings and those candidates have a good sound background um, based on scientific fact. And the information developed by the uh, particular codex committees can then be, can, well, they, they will be contributing towards the development of realistic standards for commodities and manufactured products in particular countries. So young people need to understand characteristics of specific hazards. All foods will have their own unique microbial profile, chemical profile, and possibly physical profile. And so we need to understand what the real hazards are. We need to separate the minor hazards that we will control with our good practices. So we can focus our attention on the high risk hazards and we can prevent these reaching consumers. We need to understand the probability of each of these hazards occurring. And we might, as also said this morning, be dealing with multiple hazards in one particular foodstuff. But using our scientific background um, and within a multidisciplinary team, we will be able to predict the probability of a particular risk of that hazard in a food and then be able to manage the hazard to minimize that risk and prevent foodborne illness. Technical and scientific education is required to enable the next generation um, to understand the tools that we currently use to ensure the production of a safe and wholesome food supply but also giving them the freedom to develop new tools, and new ways of managing and communicating the particular hazards that they are working with. Certainly working along the food chain in private and public sectors, developing um, collaboration between these two important areas. And also to inform consumers. Consumers shouldn't be forgotten it's, we're all consumers, we're the last step in the food chain, and we're the people who take the food home to feed our friend and friends and families, and we certainly don't want to make them ill. So the tools that we're using at the moment, certainly all food safety management is based on good practices, good agricultural practice, good aquaculture practice, um, and also known globally as the prerequisite programmes. And the good practices are the foundation for a robust hazard analysis and critical control point system. This is a preventive risk-based system that is recommended globally um, to be the basis of food safety management systems in food law. It was first recommended by Codex Alimentarius Commission in 1969, which was the year before I started work at the Natural Resources Institute. So I feel we've got something in common. HACCP is sometimes misunderstood and can be um, a very useful and user-friendly system to use, 
And so developing appropriate safety management systems for small and medium enterprises, as well as those more sophisticated systems used in larger industries. HACCP is cost effective and also contributes to minimizing waste. And we shouldn't forget that. And also supporting um, the food side of HACCP, we should also be including packaging um, and looking at sustainable packaging for the future to contribute to the circular economy. And I'm sure that um, young graduates in the future will be very active in this area. And also how we've learned in this meeting the use of digital technologies where um, information can be sent very quickly from one side of the world to another using a phone should a consignment of a particular food um, go wrong. We need to make sure that all st stakeholders working in the food chain are trained to levels commensurate with their duties. And so um, the young graduates may want to follow a path in research. They may become technical staff and managers within food factories, or they may want to turn to academia to train as lecturers and program leaders. Certainly, Working in food industries, we need our quality assurance managers, our chefs, supervisors, and of course the workforce, we'll also need to have a basic understanding of food safety practices. So over the years, I have been working with the Natural Resources Institute in developing countries, Latin America, Africa, and the Far East. I was privileged enough to work on a project in um, with the Casas University developing a food science and technology degree in 2004 with the Asia Link team. Um, through the experiences gained in my work overseas and working with the pre-accession countries in the 1990s, I developed the MSc in Food Safety and Quality Management at the Natural Resources Institute, which is part of the University of Greenwich in the UK. And that was based on my experiences of supporting national governments, strengthening their national food control systems and applying HACCP principles and tools such as risk analysis to their food supply chains. That program converted into an e-learning program, which this year has turned out to be very useful. We validated and launched the e-learning program three years ago, but in the time of COVID, I have been teaching from my front room where I'm talking to you from now um, since March. And my poor students from all over the world are in the UK being taught in their halls of residence. We do offer practical uh, classes as well. And we are encouraging our students to come onto campus and we're teaching them at distance. And as well as complementing food safety, we also offer food innovation because our food supply chains are being challenged by the climate um, and we need to look to the future and young scientists need to look to the future to have a sustainable food chain. Um, and as Sarah said before, we also offer industrial practice because there's nothing more than learning from doing. And so we encourage our students to gain experience in local food industries or if they prefer they can go home and work in their own food industries. Promoting teamwork and working in multidisciplinary teams is key for young graduates um, and also for the older folk passing on experiences and mentoring young scientists is key to their success and also international collaborations and on that note I'd like to thank you and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Linda, for the very excellent um, presentation. Uh, the, before I start the question session for you, that I uh, would like to thank you once again for um, staying with us in a very early morning in your time. I think it goes the same for um, to uh, Sarah too. So thank you very much for your time and commitment and excellent presentation. So first question that I have is about balance. 
So your uh, curriculum is teaching some food science, technology, innovation, you know, those uh, new uh, emerging technology, new exciting science to the young generation, which is really nice. And then I'm pretty sure that the young generation loves learning about new issues. But then at the same time, there is a trend, particularly in Europe, that uh, people would like to look back into the traditions, culture, and then uh, ecology and environment, you know, those kind of issues that look like um, staying in the opposite side. How your um, education curriculum teaches in terms of uh, balancing those totally different looking uh, issues into one to keep the balance? Over to you. Yeah, no, it's a, a good question, but um, certainly in the programs I've developed at NRI, the food safety and quality management system is more for the food control chains, people working in quality assurance from government through to the food industry. Um, and food innovation, as I said, is looking at innovative ingredients, um, innovative systems. But we do also include um, subjects such as risk analysis for agriculture and the environment. And we offer this to our food students in collaboration with our students studying our environment and agricultural MSCs as well. Um, and I feel the interaction here. I mean, you can't separate agriculture, food and the environment. And if we are making sure our environment is safe for food production, we are beginning to minimize risks that are getting into the food chain. So I think having that balanced um, approach, having the traditional, we need to understand the nature of different hazards associated with food. We need to understand where they're coming from, but then we also need to understand um, how we can identify specific risks and then I have strategies to, to, to overcome these. Thank you very much. And speaking of balance, um, you are a microbiologist by training, I understand, same as me. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, but the microbiologist would know very much about particular either bacteria or virus or a parasite. And then we usually focus so much on one specific thing. And then it takes time to look uh, back and then see the comprehensive issues. And then when we think about food safety, it is bigger. It is about chemicals, it is about the physical contaminants, it could be toxin, it could be technologies. So how do you, in your curriculum, that the teach people in the specific field to look in the comprehensive, coherent way of capturing the food safety as a whole? Over to you. Well, the, the first course that all of our food students study is food safety, where they get a thorough um, education in all hazards or all known hazards um, that are known by man. Um, and so we, I am a food bacteriologist by profession. I've, I'm also a food mycologist. Um, and for many years, uh, since the 1980s, I've been studying all types of hazards globally. Um, and so our students understand um, not only bacterial infections and intoxications, but also um, mycotoxins associated with different commodities and food, uh, the physical hazards. We have a very strong agriculture department and looking at chemicals used in food production um, and also um, animal husbandry as well. And aquaculture, as you're aware in your part of the world, you know, over the years there's been a misuse of, of antibiotics and uh, causing resistance in, in microorganisms. So I, th I think, well, certainly the lecturers at NRI, because we have such a, a deep grounding in work in developing countries as well as in, in the EU, we, we, we do address, it's important to give a good foundation of all the hazards and supplement that with management systems so that we can control them. Thank you very much. The last question before I um, return the microphone to Srida for the overall discussion with the older panelists. I'm going to ask all the panelists to come uh, on live in the video. But the last question from the uh, participant is that 
uh, the one participant from the region is asking you that, that uh, she or he understands that those advanced countries like a European country, USA, you know, they do have these wonderful courses in the education system. But then they, uh, this person is saying that uh, the country that this person is living is very much behind. And then there are a fewer number of teachers, uh, good teachers who can teach about food safety. And then it seems like a, a not really a good cycle to educate the young generation. How can those country uh, catch up with this uh, excellent curriculum of education. Is there any uh, good tips that the, you can give to the education ground in those countries? Over to you. Yeah, well, I think the example that Sarah gave before of Bangladesh, I mean, as I mentioned, I, I worked in um, Thailand in 2004 to 2007, helping to develop an MSc in food science and technology. And I've worked in other countries around the world to establish MSc. So, if organizations are, are funding the development of these programs overseas, then I feel that um, experienced teaching teams can provide the experience to nurture young scientists um, who want to go forward and carrying on in the teaching profession. Thank you very much, Linda. Okay, now that the, may I ask all the panelists, uh, the Rachel, uh, Bill, and Sarah, and of course, Linda, can you come online and then turn on your video, please, so that we can start the panel discussions, please. Thank you. Thank you, Basami. So, okay, William is online. Hello, Sridhar. I'm on audio, but if maybe the host could allow access to my video. Yeah, same for me. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Um, and Rachel, do we have? Okay, Rachel, could you? All okay. right. There you thank go. you. Okay. First of all, let me uh, thank you all for staying online and I promise we won't take this beyond the scheduled closing time. I know all of you have logged in at all kinds of inconvenient hours. Uh, so can you just, if I'll just go back um, and first go to Rachel. So Rachel, I mean, you uh, talked to us all about um, misinformation and how to address that. And then you heard the speakers later who talked about um, having, you know, who are actually in the middle of developing these training courses to develop the next generation of food safety professionals. So would mm -hmm. you uh, have a, um, a thought or a word about actually having something on misinformation in these courses, since it's very much a reality of our times and uh, the use of technology, social media, probably different ways of uh, different kinds of apps is only going to grow from here, it won't get down. So would you have any thoughts and suggestions on that? Or yeah, I think um, it's it's important to acknowledge what is going on in the online sphere. And unfortunately, um, even if we are living in bubbles individually where we only share verified information, hopefully, um, there are lots of people out there who are only really seeing unverified in social media so i think uh, incorporating any kind of um kind of education or any kind of course on on how to detect misinfo or how to debunk it or how to be wary of it would would always be very helpful um you know it's something that we as an agency uh i think we took a little while to kind of get our heads around it because we're so used to focusing on the real news and but you know just reporting what is that happening rather than you know the fake news as some people may call it um so i, I think i appreciate it's, it's a very emerging area and, and you might think that some of these falsehoods are, are just silly and innocuous but it turns out that they are um creating a lot of discord and and kind of confusion um in many parts of the world indeed thank you so um a bill coming to you um again trying to link what uh, Rachel said. So 
the way social media tends to take over these days and affects our risk communication. And especially that's where then we have authorities who have to scramble to put out some messaging in some format to reassure or inform the public. So would you see now then again, uh, this sort of social media training becoming an important part, especially for control authorities that they need to be aware or keep pace in some way, although this is not so easy to say. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Over to you, Bill. So no question um, that, you know, we need to be teaching the, the, the next gener. Well, let me, let me put it this way. We should be teaching the current generation of, <laughs> of, of food safety professionals um, how to interact on social media in ways that are, are particularly constructive. Um, I have a great frustration that many of my, my scientific colleagues are actually reluctant to engage on social media. Um, you know, I appreciate that Rachel has 94 people working for her, but we need, you know, 940,000 people who are willing to engage online. You know, we can't leave it to Rachel and to her group to, to fact check everything. You know, it's a shared responsibility. We need to engage. We need to, to, to call out the virally disseminated nonsense that's out there um, and, and take it on all of ourselves. So we need to train people how to do that, how to do that properly, how to demand evidence. So we need to teach the, 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 the people producing the information. But as was said in an earlier talk, we also need to be teaching the public and, and you know, our undergrads how to correctly identify um, nonsense and, and how to demand evidence and, and how to ground truth themselves what these issues are uh, before passing it on. So absolutely, um, we, we, need, we need to be training people how to do this. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, and yes, I agree, that's very good advice. Uh, and yes, I do agree. A lot of us, uh, and let's say, including yours truly, are pretty much challenged when it comes to social media. So it is something for all of us to, to improve upon. So Sarah, again, uh, linking into this, um, and since you spoke a lot about the course developed in Bangladesh, and that's a country where social media has exploded over the last few years. And, and in fact, all the uh, related to it, all the other services and apps and e-commerce and so on. So where do you see that as, a, as, as having a place in the course? I mean, would it be something that you would need to upgrade or need to fit in as you go along? Thank you for that um, question, Sridhar. It's interesting when we were in Bangladesh, it was one thing that really struck out was everybody has a mobile phone and, and most people have two mobile phones and to purchase a mobile phone, it's quite inexpensive. And we saw evidence where people maybe had no home, had no roof over their head, maybe had little food available to them, but yet they had two mobile phones. And in one way we can actually take advantage of this um, technology that most people appear to have in Bangladesh and, and it's all ages and all generations. Um, and maybe we can use this technology, maybe development of a food safety app or food safety videos or something that's very easily accessible, maybe even snippets of information um, or videos online. We have incorporated aspects of this already into the curriculum. And part of this is specifically to do with food labeling and also um, purchasing import and export of products as well and regulation of import and export as well. The big aspect is labeling, specifically in relation to health claims and labeling. I noted earlier on that, um, I can't remember who mentioned about, wouldn't it be great if agencies would share this information with us? And actually, we've had that conversation with the Food Safety Authority in Ireland, and we have actually asked them if we had that information, rather than just snippets from the news media, we could actually use those as detailed case studies within the curriculum. So rather than having to try and fill in the gaps yourself by bits of information that you get maybe through the media or through information on the website, we actually have asked them for 
detailed information on whether it was outbreaks or food fraud. And actually they're very open to sharing that information for educational purposes. And we can use these um, as educational training tools. And even for the profession, for maybe the food safety officers, they can be used in CPD courses as well. So that information is invaluable. Thank you, Shreda. Thank you, Sarah. So, uh, so Linda, what would you say to uh, as well to that suggestion? Since you actually, you uh, as you showed, you in fact your Greenwich University does a variety of other courses as well, where it might be useful to feed in the fact that a lot of info there is a lot of misinformation around, and along the food chain, not just about food safety, but on various aspects of food production as well, and along the chain. So, how would we? look at it in terms of incorporating it into curriculum or making it a regular part of our education? Over to you, Linda. I, I believe, I mean, as, as, as we said previously, it's important that we teach our students and younger folk coming into food businesses that um, what the truth is, what, what the facts, the known facts are, what we're establishing our decisions on or things may change. We have emerging pathogens and other emerging hazards. Um, and certainly the use of technology for, for, for promoting these or, or uh, communicating um, with our students. I mean, our MSc students, as well as joining together on in our platforms, also have their WhatsApp groups. And so, you know, if they think, did she really say that? You know, it'll be amongst all the students before, um, and I won't know anything about it. So. Um, but I think we need to teach them how to differentiate between fact and fiction uh, so that they can make their, their own decisions in the future. Because um, I mean, obviously Rachel's job is fantastic, but, but we can't all rely on her team's work. And um, I think our students need to also understand that there's fake news out there. Um, and, and how to and how to deal with it yeah thank you linda yes indeed uh, that that is probably the way forward as um, as part of the curriculum <coughs> development so uh, i'll come back now to rachel i know rachel you have to you have another appointment waiting so just one last thing before we before we let you go so do you keep a uh, sort of or do you analyze um, the, uh, you know, who is asking you for um, news or, or, or asking you to verify certain misinformation? Is there a sort of way that you look at, you know, the different categories of people, they could be businesses, they could be entities who are actually requesting some sort of misinformation or fact checking, or you're completely doing it on your own? Or, I mean, would that in some way help to the food control authorities to know where in fact the problem is or even the solution? Um, we do have a tip line. Uh, we operate um, by email generally, uh, which anyone can, can email um, at any time. And we will decide whether this is something we, we want to fact check. Um, we also have a WhatsApp, WhatsApp tip line uh, just in India at the moment because that's a that's a place we we wanted to launch that um, but I would say in general um, we are the ones looking for the misinformation rather than receiving it uh, from other individuals um, and we would only fact check something based on merit um, not based on whether any particular group or person or institution asks us to fact check it um, we're wholly independent in in that sense um, so you know we are uh, you know a media organization who who has complete freedom to to fact check what we deem to be um you know uh, a high level of misinformation or, or in the public interest to debunk. Um, I, I would say that the people that sometimes come to us with tips are often just good Samaritans who, who think that something needs to be corrected. Um, occasionally they might 
be um, holding a particular political agenda. Uh, so therefore, we would be a bit more skeptical about whether we, we should be fact checking this. Um, but as I say, you know, the the context of who the person is, is not super important to us. We just assess each claim on its individual merits. Um, and then we decide whether it's going to work for a story. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. And um, uh, I'm sure you actually now have an overflowing tip line when you go back to your desk. So we, are, we will let you do that if you want to, but you want to stay on the call, you're welcome to. But thank you very much for joining us in the middle of your day. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Now that um, I would like to ask the rest of the panel that um, as you can imagine that we have a quite few number of young generation uh, students and graduate students listening into this conference. So I would love to have a short message from each of you if that is possible for somebody who is learning some uh, topics related to food safety, thinking about career in this field. So shall we start from uh, Bill? Is that okay? That's perfectly fine. Um, so I, I, clearly I'm an educator and what I teach people to do is to talk about risk, talk about, you know, to engage in risk communication. And, and the, perhaps the most important message I can deliver is that, that risk communication is a skill that needs to be learned and practiced. Um, you can't simply go on your own intuition as to what actually will make sense to people. You do need to be trained. And the thing that I think is most difficult to, to train people to do, particularly scientists, um, the most important skill in risk communication is the ability to listen, um, the ability to ask good questions and to hear the answers and to understand what people actually mean despite what they say. So using a little bit of psychology to understand what are the values that they're expressing? What are the fears that they're expressing? You know, using the particular example that they are, that they are giving you. Um, you know, when we're doing fact checking, for example, often the issue isn't the specific fact, it's kind of the underlying concern that we really need to address. Otherwise, we, you know, we'll spend the rest of our lives trying to do fact checking one at a time. Um, so learn to listen, learn to ask good questions, and learn to address the underlying issues, not just the surface issues. Thank you, Bill. Okay, next, uh, Sarah, could you give us a short message to the young generation? Thank you. I'd be delighted to. And actually, the message that I would give um, the younger people is it's exactly the same message that I give when I'm doing career days or open days at home in Ireland. And my advice is do your research, go online, shop around, look at different universities, look at different programs, contact somebody who's running the program, contact the program director, ask for the brochure, go online, look at the curriculum. I would also suggest that they should maybe try and reach out if possible to people who are on the program or people who have graduated and have experience of the program because they're the best ambassadors actually for the program. I often find people don't want to talk to me at all. They'd much rather talk to students who are on the program and people who have graduated from the program as well. And often, again, we're talking about social media, but we have social media groups and alumni groups for food safety officers and for food safety students as well. Those networks are already established and you can tap into those. I would also suggest that the students consider talking to professionals who are working in the field. Ask them about their typical day. Ask them about their typical week. Ask them about the challenges for their job. Ask them about the highlights of their job as well. So you want to get a very realistic insight into what does the course hold, but then what, does, what are the job opportunities as well? I think too, the students should think this is a great opportunity. It's a great career choice, food safety management. 
Wonderful, great message. Thank you. Last but not least, uh, Linda, please. Yeah, I think the last two speakers have said <laughs> most of it, but certainly um, encouraging individuals to find the area of food safety or quality that appeals to them to, to get information on that and to look at the range of commodities. And also, you know, we're talking of international students looking at food production chains in their own countries that do need to be improved and, and finding roles to, to work to, to improve the safety of locally produced foods. Um, but, but certainly, yeah, I mean, the first thing I always say to my um, students every year is to ask questions. Don't be frightened to ask questions. Um, people will just sit and look at you, but, but you, you know they really do want to ask a question. So asking questions and making sure you get an answer that you are happy with is important. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you all of you that for excellent advice to the young generation that I am sure they are listening into. And thank you for your time. Now that it's a bit sad, but then our uh, program is uh, become, um, closing to the end. And um, I will return the microphone to my colleague Schrader, who will be uh, wrapping up this entire conference in four sessions. And Schrader, please. Thank you, Masami. So it is now my very pleasant duty to thank everybody, thank all of you, especially thank all the speakers, the ones who were there today and the ones who were there on all the four day, on the three days previously, and who shared the knowledge and experience with all of us. Uh, for all the all the inputs that we got from them, the information and all the comments and the messages in the chat that we got from all of you, dear participants, it helps to enrich our work. It, and I certainly, I can say on behalf of our team here, we learned a lot and that's what food safety is all about. We need to keep learning and improving and we hope to incorporate that in our work as we go forward. And as we say during all our meetings right now, especially at these times, for those of you who need to go to bed, I wish you a good night. Those of you who got out of bed but need to get back, well, I wish you a good rest. And to those of you who are need to get about their work either in the morning or resume your work in the afternoon, well, continue having a good day. Importantly, stay safe, stay healthy, and you're free to share the YouTube link for our conference with anybody that you please, because this is real information and everything has been checked. And thank you very much once again and have a nice day. Thank you very much, everybody. The special thanks to once again that our partner, the Thai government, Minister of Public Health, thank you very much for all the efforts and all the time commitment. And then also that we have a special video to end this wonderful conference that we have 10 countries compilation video to show you. So enjoy the last video and then have a nice day, evening and afternoon. Goodbye, everybody. FAO has been instrumental in introducing food safety in the country and building the Bhutan Agriculture and Food Regulatory Authority as a food safety agency right from the inception. The Ministry together with the financial and technical support of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the of FAO. Farmers were trained on the importance of improving soil health in order to improve the tolerance or in order to increase the tolerance of their crops to pests and diseases. Food safety is enormously important for India. We have a population of 1.35 billion people. We are promoting the concept of green rye landscape. 
it is not only for food safety but also the conservation around the aqua biodiversity of the rice field together fao and ministry of agriculture and forestry have developed the green and sustainable agriculture strategic framework and the green agriculture strategic program FAO is always with us, with government organizations. We are working in very good coordination. We have a lot of examples with the FAO. A very good example is integrated pest management program that we have worked together to, to make the very good production process to the farmers by implementing farmers' feed school to reduce pesticide in the vegetables and other crops. Food safety goes along with our vision of helping Filipino food producers. Food trade of frozen chicken, pork, fish are very important in the economy. Because we import over 90% of our food, we work closely with other countries as well as international bodies such as FAO, and codex to ensure the safety of our food. Another area where we have partnered with um, FAO is in the area of ongoing um, national capacity development and enhancement of our staff and officers, basically because we want to strengthen our food safety measures and systems in the country. In the year 2000. For the government declared the year as a food safety year and approved the roadmap of food safety since then. The roadmap of food safety has been implemented along the food chain. We participate in the codex standard setting, provide comment and data, and also propose standards and data information for setting up the codex standard. Thailand has set a goal to become one of the 10 food production center of the future. Coupled with the food safety issue, we are therefore well aware that our responsibility is not only for the health and safety for Thai people but also for all peoples around the world who consume Thai food. Moreover, Thailand works with the FAO in another issue, including food safety information exchange and coordination through the International Food Safety Authority Network, or InfoSan. We aspire that not only food is our culture, but food safety will be our culture as well.